welcome to Stanley Community College. That being said, it really is an honor to be able to host this type of event. This is the second year, if I recall correctly, that we have had this, this event on campus. Stanley Community College really is striving to be a driver as it relates to economic development. Now I could talk about economic development, you can put you guys to sleep, but I'm, trying, I'm gonna not do that. But what we as a college are trying to do is try to make Stanley County a better place to work and a better place to live. And in doing that, we need to make sure that people have jobs. There are lots of ways that the college is trying to do that, but one of the cornerstone activities that the college is committed to, to try to spur economic development, make sure that people have jobs, is related to entrepreneurship or small business development. It's critical that Stanley County and you guys and the citizens in Stanley County are committed to developing your own businesses. Now, that can be a pretty scary task to think about, well, what does that mean? How, how do I start a business? Well, I'm just in cosmetology. I'm, I don't know about how to start a business and getting a license and setting up accounting and all of those kinds of things. That's okay. You may be in collision repair. You may be interested in opening up your own shop. You're, you're great at working on automobiles, but you probably aren't as experienced at setting up books and, and running the, the front end. That's okay. We have faculty and staff who are second to none in this state that can help you. All you've got to do is take the first step and ask for help. The college this, this community college, I'm, I hope you believe this, we really are one of the best in the state. And, but we can't do it all. I'm asking for your help. We, we can't do it. We need you. You've got to take the first step. You've got to say, I'm interested. I want to, I want to start my own business. If you do that, We've got so many resources available to help you be successful, it's not funny. But you've got to be willing to take that first step. So what we want is we want today to be kind of an eye-opening experience for you to learn more about what entrepreneurship is all about and how that could look for you. Your success is our success. We are in the business of helping you be successful. Now that sounds corny, that's a fact. We're not, we're not a for-profit business. The college isn't a for-profit business, so we're not out trying to take advantage of you to pad our bottom line. We truly are committed to your success, but we need you to be as committed to your success as we are. So I appreciate you being here. That's the first step. The next step is pay attention. Don't go to sleep today, okay? And then the next step is to seek out that help because we really do have those resources available, but they don't know that they don't know what your interests are unless you make those known. Okay. So with that being said, I appreciate Mr. Massa being here today. I was joking with him a few minutes ago. He taking up a lot of my parking spots out there this morning. I don't know if you guys saw that, but uh, I think it's pretty exciting. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stick around and see his entire presentation. But if you guys didn't see what he has set up outside, I think it's pretty cool. You guys are certainly in for a treat. Enjoy today's activities. It's a good break away from your traditional routine. If nothing else, enjoy that break from your traditional routine. But individually, if you are interested in starting a small business, you're in the right place because uh, these two individuals here, Mike and Alicia, they're, they're great, but our entire faculty and staff are committed to helping you be successful. And that's the takeaway. That's one of the takeaways you need to remember. If you don't remember anything else, that's what I want you to remember at the end of today, that all you've got to do is make it known and we'll do everything we can. We're not going to do everything for you. We may say you need to go forth and do your, do your homework, but we'll be there to help you help guide you along the way. With that being said, that's going to conclude my remarks. Have a great day. Thank you again for being here. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Enumite. So, wanted to, again, reiterate, we're here to help. Um, in the packets that you received, did everyone get a t-shirt? Yes. Did everyone get a packet? 
Yes, awesome. Well, in there is my contact information, other contact information for those at the college. Again, please, if you have nothing else that you take away today, know that we're here to help and you have our contact information, all the resources available to you because uh, we do have a small business center here at the college and it, through that small business center, we assist current and prospective small business owners through free confidential counseling, training, seminars, sessions like this. So again, I hope that I get to see each and every one of you um, at some point throughout your stay here at the college. And, and as you go on to do great things, we're here to partner with you as your students and after you graduate. So without further ado, though, to talk about some of our students and their great accomplishments, I would like to welcome Miss Dana Cheney down. So Miss Dana is a program head for business here at the college, but she recently had a class complete a, a tremendous project. I was a part of that, the um, presentations for those, the business plan presentations. And so I'm going to turn this over to her and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Alicia, and thanks to all of my students from Business 110 um, for being here this morning. This is our introductory to business class. Um, that's actually the class that I took here at Stanley Community College. Um, I sat in your seats many years ago, had no clue what I wanted to be when I grew up, so I took intro to business here at Stanley Community College, and I had a lot of fun, and I was like, you know, it's very flexible. That's what I want to do, so um, I started here, and then I transferred to UNC Charlotte. So I consider the business administration degree the flexible degree, right? I say it's flexible for your future because we know our world today is changing so very rapidly and it's hard to prepare for careers that may not even exist today, right? So you want something that will allow you to pivot and that's what this major has allowed me to do is to pivot from working in telecommunications, working in human resources, to now being here and being fortunate to work with all of my students. So in my Business 110 class this semester, I always give my students an option of what do we want to do, guys? What do we want to investigate? What do we want to learn more about? And I had three very innovative teams that said, Miss Cheney, we want to do the business plan. And uh, we have three very different ideas. So we divided the class into three teams. Teams, and they came up with three very different businesses and um, I had a panel come in and see their final presentations and the competition was extremely tight. Um, I had to go down into my rubric and go item by item to break the tie that we had. So um, as I call your team, for those of you that are in here, if I, when I put your business, if you'll just stand for your particular business and let the group recognize you and then we'll say who had the overall best business plan in in Business 110 this semester. So our first group was the Power Station, okay? So if you guys will stand. All right, <clears throat> thank you. So this is Bradley Flo, Zadi Sylvester. Yeah, give them a round of applause. <clears throat> All right, thank you guys. So this is Zadi, Kenneth Wall, and Christopher Mallet, who I don't think is here. Thank you guys. So they came up with an idea of similar to a food truck, but re really specializing in healthy smoothies and protein supplements. And they would travel around to gyms and health, healthy events, 5Ks. They really wanted to target some students over at UNC Charlotte. So um, that was our power station and nice job Zadi coming up with that name. I thought it was very catchy. So our second team, our deep group, Nick, Brandon, Noah and AJ, thank you guys. They came up with El Dorado Investments. So they want to help young people invest in commodities, primarily gold. Um, they want to help people start building their wealth at a young age, but in a fun way. So they came up, I mean, they dug, they showed graphs of how the price of gold had changed over the years. Very impressive, very impressed with this team's business plan. So kudos to this team. And our final team is Mobile Plus. So if that team would stand, And this team consisted of Ty Dowdy, Alexis, say it anyway, <laughs> Brandon Sweat and Courtney Smith. And theirs again was a mobile oil change facility. So they said, you know, 
it's boring going to get your oil changed and all they ever have is coffee and if you have kids oh god right so they said what if the oil change came to you and not only did your oil change but maybe some tire rotations change your wipers and here you are in the comfort of your home doing what you need to do so rather than it being a time strain it becomes hey this is personalized for me and so that was their idea was with mobile plus so all of these businesses really took advantage of technology but the advantage that a small business has is they can combine not only high tech but also high touch and that is critical for any small business. So we ask each of our businesses to do an actual presentation and we had a panel consisting of Mr. Sperling and Miss Alicia Heron, Elena Finney, and then Dalton Reeder from our accounting team and they came in and evaluated the presentations and we had a tie. I mean an exact tie. So that's when I had to drill into what did they contribute with their actual business plans. And so one team hit all the items. So at that point, it became very clear. So I would like to recognize this team and I would like to invite them down to come and get their certificates and another gift that we have for you. So the winner is Mobile Plus. Ty Dowdy, Alexis, Courtney Smith, and Brandon Sweat. Come on down, guys. This team, one of the things we got them for in the presentation is they didn't have their startup costs, but then I looked at their business plan and they had it itemized in an Excel format, so very impressive. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> So we gave them, in addition to their certificates, a copy of a book. It's called Who Owns the Ice House? And it's the text that we use in our ETR 210, our entrepreneurship class. And it talks about some of the key things of entrepreneurship. And I'm sure that Mr. Sperling's probably going to be talking about some of those themes today as we progress. As I get out of the way, I would like to tell you, and I hope you can see this, um, with our business administration degree, we have a variety of options. You can go for the two-year associate's degree. You can get an, a diploma in one year. And then several of our um, certificate options is just a couple semesters. So I have people, I get plenty of cause students who come in and they want to do the entrepreneurship certificate. I've also gotten plenty of four-year students that have graduated from a university that are coming back and doing the marketing or the entrepreneurship certificate. So I'd love to work with all of you. Um, we'll make it practical. We'll make it work for you and look forward to seeing what you do in your careers going forward. Thank you. So the importance of including um, Dana's portion in our presentation is we want to celebrate successes and her um, her class did a fantastic job, worked very hard and as you'll see throughout the day it's all about success, creativity, um, opportunity, that's what entrepreneurship is, um, thinking outside of the box. So again I want to commend those those groups that were a part of her class, she did a fantastic job and as I welcome Mike Sperling to the stage to get his, his PowerPoint up and going. Good morning. I just want to say the uh, the three groups that did present on what was that last Friday, last Thursday. last Thursday, afterwards I did go out and buy a power drink, got the oil changed to my car, <laughs> and I tried to buy some gold, but it was before payday, so I couldn't do that. <laughs> but you guys did a great job, and we're we're very proud with, of what you did. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> illuminating your pathway, the entrepreneurial mindset. And I like to say entrepreneurial mindset slash growth mindset. I know, and you know, some of you are never going to own a business. And yet, you're going to work for somebody or some organization, and you're going to want to be an excellent employee and someone that rises to the top, someone that's noticed, someone that becomes the employee that they don't want to get rid of, they need. If you adopt this growth mindset, I think you can be that employee. So the, entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneurial growth mindset has us develop a capacity to see opportunity ahead of, uh, instead of difficulties. We're all going to run into difficulties in our lives, 
But within those difficulties, there is opportunity. You'll see a little bit later on about that. I believe that our intelligence, talents, and skills can always be improved, right? We are not born with fixed intelligence. Some people mistakenly believe we are, that yeah, I'm not good at math, I will never be good at math. If you train in math, you can become good at math, right? We compare ourselves to the other people who look like, boy, they know it, it's no effort, I must not be up to par. You are, just have to persist. Growth mindset, entrepreneurial mindset is very empowering. You, even myself as part of this organization, I, I have a growth mindset, and I sure my supervisors, sometimes it might annoy them, but I don't let that stop me. I keep on pushing, we keep on thinking of new ideas and new directions to go in. Sometimes it falls on deaf ears, but sometimes we, we get some traction. Values progress, not perfect. Uh, Perfection, none of us is gonna be perfect. If you wait until you have the perfect plan, what you think is the perfect solution to a problem, you, chances are you're gonna be waiting forever. Because something in, the, in your mind or somebody you meet, always gonna put a little like, they, maybe if they roll their eyes or they, they, they look uninterested, you perceive that as it's not good enough. You're not looking for perfection, you don't go up swinging for a home run every time. Sometimes you just get a, a, a single. And if you, it, fuse, fa it fuels, fuels, fuse failure or setbacks as learning opportunities. You all know about our habit, uh, what's his name? Who created the light bulb? Edison, I'm glad to see you still learn about Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, created the light bulb, invented the light bulb. Did he, was it one shot and it worked? No, it took years of failure, trial and error. He didn't give up, he persisted. And now we have light. Probably would have had light anyway, but we credit it with him. Success, Winston Churchill, everyone here, everyone here has heard about Winston Churchill? I don't want to date myself, but Winston Churchill was an important person in history. He was alive before I was born, so I'm not that old. But he uh, has this quote that I thought is uh, pretty interesting. Success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Again, we're going to fail. We're going to fail, fail often in our lifetime. I have a master's degree, a master's degree in accounting. I have additional hours in business administration, and I even have some doctorate level uh, credits. Some because I got tired of going to school. Well, <laughs> but I started at a community college right out of high school. First time I went to community college, I think I lasted about three weeks. I took my first accounting class. <laughs> Score was a 27. That was enough to tell me I can't be an accountant. I gave up. Right. A year or two later, tried again. This time I was going to go into meat processing for some reason. And I saw the first piece of cow that they wanted us to chop up or something. And I said, I can't. And I gave up. I was, I was not going to do that. Waited a few, more, for a few more years and went into the military. Came out of the military went back to college, and this time I persisted. I stayed with it, and I really haven't stopped learning since because we continually have to bring new skills to the table to keep ourselves vibrant and needed in this community. So there will be setbacks. We do learn from our failures, and with an entrepreneurial mindset, we learn, we accept that we're going to persist. Which made me think, any, anyone here have younger brothers, sisters, toddlers, one year old, two years old, right? You ever watch them? They're amazing, aren't they? Especially when they start to walk. They pull them, they grab onto any, anything they can, any piece of furniture, they pull themselves up, they take two steps and they fall, right? Do they give up? No, they laugh, they get back up and say, 
and take two more steps, fall. Eventually, within a small amount of time, really, they're running around the room, and you wish they would fall. So they're, they're you know, we learn, entrepreneurial, when you can think of it, toddlers have that growth entrepreneurial mindset. They continue to persist until they get done what they need to, be, to do. A little cartoon, toddler falling, up, up when he's successful, he's happy, or she. Now, within the entrepreneurial growth mindset, there are certain, certain key words, empowering words that, that you, you embrace. I'm not gonna go over them all, unless you wanna spend this afternoon with me, that's fine. But one is choice. Your life changes the moment you make a new, congruent, and committed decision. Every choice you make changes your life in some way. Might be small, it might be big, but every choice you make changes your life. So you wanna make good, informed choices. You don't wanna just gut reaction all the time, especially when it's big uh, things. You wanna take time, you wanna do some research, you wanna get some education, and then you go forward with what, of your various options, you try to pick what's gonna be the best choice. Sometimes it's not, you have to go back to the drawing board and start again. So the choices you make really do determine the outcome of your lives, right? We're all born into certain conditions, uh, socioeconomic or, or whatever, right? And that does influence our life and that does influence our mindset, but that's not the deciding factor where we end up. It's up to us to accept the growth mindset, the entrepreneurial mindset, and make choices for ourselves. We are in control of our lives, no one else. Rather than reacting to circumstances, intentionally choose the way you're gonna respond. Think about it, you don't wanna just be a, is everyone familiar with a sand dollar? A sand dollars, they float in with the tide, they float out with the tide. They really have no choice, they just float around. Who wants to be a sand dollar? Nobody wants to be a sand dollar here, right? End up on someone's shelf, some kid throws you in bleach and, and it's over. You want to make choices. You want to decide where you're gonna go. Not the tide, not the gang, but you yourself. <clears throat> you have to choose to have faith and expectations for yourself beyond the ordinary. Who wants to be ordinary? Does anyone want to be ordinary? Now, nah, you all want to be extraordinary, don't you? I know, sometimes you don't want to stand out, you don't want to stick out, but I tell, I'm telling you now, stand out, stick out. You all have unique skills and abilities. Take advantage of it. Don't worry that someone else is gonna laugh at you or someone else is gonna believe less of you. Who cares? Be yourself and you will have some su success. Dare to be different. Now this was just hung in our Patterson building yesterday and I like it. Dare to be different. Who's the bird that hangs upside down? It might look crazy, but that bird's different. And I don't know why I put the picture of that, <laughs> that donkey or jackass or whatever you want to call it, but dare to be different. He's not, he's happy. Look at him. Another key word, another key thing to accept is opportunity. Albert Einstein, we've all heard of Albert Einstein, correct? Albert Einstein said, in the midst of difficulty lies opportunity. When you have a problem, or when you approach a difficult situation, there's opportunity in that situation. You might not see it at first, you might have to brainstorm, you might have to think of different ideas, and really the, the, best, the best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. So if you have a lot of ideas, but there's only one best idea, some of the ideas aren't that good, doesn't matter. Throw ideas out there, keep your mind engaged, work, work, work. Don't 
close down again don't allow yourself to be uh, swept away with the current be open opportunity solutions solutions are entrepreneurs currency now again I say some of you are not going to open your own business some of you have no intentions of opening your own business but you're gonna work for an organization this is a college we all work for a college we have solutions. Hopefully we bring a lot of solutions to the table because we're always pushing forward. I want Stanley Community College to have the best business and accounting and agribusiness and cosmetology program in the state. I think we're there. Well, I think we're really getting there, but we always have to improve. And there's gotta be little tweaks and things. There's little problems. Well, some people might look at them as little problems, I just look at them as opportunities to make our program even better. And we will have, I guarantee it, we will have the best business and career technology department, not just in this state, but in this country, without a doubt. I bet my bottom dollar on it. So opportunity, it's not gonna knock unless you build a door. You have to be open to that opportunity. And you have to remember, problems don't stop me, they inspire me. Problems are fun. You look at problems and you think, okay, this is a problem. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Creatively, creativity, creatively. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> to get through that, right? How am I going to make that problem an opportunity? Think that way, it will happen. Why are you all here? Education. Anyone ever hear Carol Dweck? I know, I always say it, I think I'm saying it incorrectly, but that's her name, Dweck. <laughs> and this is important because I know when I was a student, even at an older age, I would sit in a classroom, take a test, and I'd be on question number five and the person next to me would be handing in the test. I was thinking, oh my God, I don't know this stuff. Look at that person knows and that person knows it all. Well, and you start getting in that mindset that, you know, they're born that way. They're born with that natural ability that I don't have. Well, I'll tell you, it doesn't matter what gifts they have. If you get the proper training, you too could do the same thing, if not better, right? Apply yourselves, engage yourself, push yourself. Let me tell you a story. A lady was uh, in a park and there was an, an, an artist, right? And he was painting uh, some portraits. So the lady said, oh, how much are you charged to paint the portrait of me? And he said, uh, $50. And she said, well, that's a great price, okay. She sat down, he did his thing real quick, boom, boom, boom. 10 minutes later, turned around the portrait, the canvas, and she was amazed, it was great. And then she started thinking, that only took you 10 minutes. I'm gonna pay you $50 for 10 minutes worth of work? That's more than I pay my doctor. You know, that's, that's, that's a bit excessive. But what she didn't know and what the artist told her is for me to get this good at painting that 10 minute picture, it took me 10 years of trial and error, 10 years of practice to get to that point, right? Education adds up. Eventually, it brings success. It's part of your toolbox. See, we don't always see everything we only see the tip of the iceberg, we don't see what's underneath. And what's underneath is all the education, everything that person had to do in order to do their uh, job correctly. Now, what's missing? I have education, I have, I've made choices, I saw some opportunity, and I got a, great, a lot of great ideas in my mind. What else do I need? Come on, someone must know. What, money? Yeah, then let's not worry about money. 
action. Who said action? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Many friends said action, right. What good is it without action, right? All the great ideas in the world and nothing unless we act upon them. Take action. An inch of movement will bring you closer to your goals than a mile of intention, right? We all have great ideas. That's fine. You got to let those ideas. I, I have 7,000 ideas in my head, right? And sometimes they, I like to think that they, they germinate. They go in different parts of my brain, and some take root, and they start growing. Other ones just die, right? So you have to do something, right? It doesn't mean that every idea you get, you go run right out and, and do something about it. You have to perhaps work with it. You have to grow it. <sighs> Elena Finney gave me these seeds. He's our agribusiness instructor. And these are pretty flowers. Everyone can see the flowers there? Pretty, uh, well, I, 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 trust me, they're pretty flowers. <laughs> and I have them on my desk and nothing's happened. No flowers. Why? I have to plant them, don't I? I have to do something with them. I could keep them on my desk for, or on the floor for 20 years and nothing's gonna happen, right? Unless the building comes down, maybe, I don't know. But, <laughs> I shouldn't say that about our buildings. Uh, but, it requires action. I gotta take those seeds out of that packet. I have to put them in soil. I have to water them, action. And nothing's good. No idea will come to fruition without action. You must take action, realize your dreams. You must be unafraid to move forward. If you stumble and fail, so what? You get up, right? Everyone should think, whenever they have a good idea, I will take action, I will act. Action changes things. Without action, we have nothing. And of course, persistence. We must persist. Calvin Coolidge, everyone here Calvin Coolidge? One of our lesser known presidents, and I frankly don't know much about him at all. If we had a history teacher here, maybe she could, or he or she could tell us some. But Calvin Coolidge should say this, I thought it was kind of interesting. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not, genius will not, education will not. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent, all right? The greatest ideas, the greatest things don't always work, but we have to persist. I, if I do plant those seeds, and maybe I will. Now there's a chance, the reason I haven't planted it is because I don't really have much, much luck when I plant things. Normally it just stays a bucket of dirt. But perhaps, with a little persistence, I could look at the, what I've done with that, those seeds and decide what I'm doing wrong. Am I giving it too much water? Probably. Uh, did I put them too deep? Probably not, because I just sprinkle them on top. And then uh, Lena did tell me I'm supposed to put them under an inch of soil, right? So now I gotta persist, and I will have flowers one day. <laughs> Hopefully not on my grave. <laughs> this is my last slide. And this is, I, I like this slide, because it shows me something. I will never give up. Never give up. Now that mouse, he probably watched everyone else in his mouse family go and get that cheese. He's from the cosmetology building. <laughs> he probably watched everyone else in that building go and get cheese and not be successful. He got himself a little football helmet, right? Never give up. Persist and you will succeed. Each and every one of you will succeed. There's no doubt in my mind you have in it, you have within you everything you need to be successful. 
and plus you have community you have us you have Dana you have Elena you have Merlin you have Alicia and Philip and Andre and Mark and oh all our cars Linda and Tammy and and Kimberly and I, I don't know if I'm missing it. there's David Smith there right you have all these people we're all here we're here for one reason Tabitha Bailey John we're here for one reason one reason only well two reasons one we want to get paid <laughs> the second reason we're here is we want you to be successful that's our life's goal this is why we're here most of us because <laughs> we get this thrill out of success there's nothing better than when a student I'm sure when a college student cuts their first little hair thing their mannequin and it looks terrible but by the end of their training they're doing some beautiful work and it's it, those cos cosmetology instructors feel real happy they share in your success we share in your success so when you're successful we're successful your success makes us really happy we are here to help you be successful so good luck come talk to us don't be afraid of us you always find me in the Patterson building hallway <laughs> I walk back and forth all day long so come stop say hello thank you Um, I want to take just a moment to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sam Massa. It's been a pleasure knowing him, meeting him. I was in a, 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 at an event where he spoke uh, maybe about two years ago, and I was just so inspired. And I'm around people that start businesses all the time, and um, but he's just very unique. And so this opportunity for you to, to sit and engage with him, um, he's going to be a part of our panel later. I um, encourage you to ask him questions. This is a tremendous opportunity. And as Dr. Enemite had mentioned, Sam has been gracious enough to bring two of his trucks for display, and we'll have some time at the end of today's session to go look at that. So I um, wanted to tell you just a little bit about Sam, a, a good profile on him is that he's an enthusiastic entrepreneur passionate about inventing or improving I'm sorry the fire emergency services industry um, he's creative with a go-to-market strategy um, he does things like relationship building motivational speaking uh, he's a technical subject matter expert with fundamental credibility gained through work in the energy service industry and he's continuing to grow his business through partnerships key executives and growth we were talking before the session he's so gracious he was in well out of the state uh, flew in um, to be here with us today and he's going to fly back out he's was at 171 days a year you're you're off at, at, on the road I mean he's and it, he started um, perhaps similarly to, to how some of you guys are starting. So I hope you enjoy this. A few last little things I want to say about Sam. Um, he wrote language adopted by um, a technical committee, and it was implemented into the 2016 standard for automated fire apparatus revision cycles. That's pretty impressive. Um, also, he's authored numerous articles that have been published. He's a firefighter of the year, two different years, 2012, 2015. Um, received Chief's Award through... Um, uh, local fire station, fire and rescue service. Uh, he designed, manufactured, and installed co-reducing biofuel solutions. If that wasn't amazing enough, um, that does, he also designed and installed fuel systems for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's personal fleet of H1 Hummers. So, um, and he, he started in around D.C., right? Now he's here in North Carolina. I mean, but he's done work for the governor of California. It's just amazing. So, again, wanted to just introduce him. And, uh, Sam, I want to turn the floor over to you, and thank you again for being here today. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Whoa. Hey there. All right, cool. So I was standing here before watching everyone mess with the mic, and I thought I would be like Ricky Bobby eating the thing. So <laughs> I'll start off. Thank you for the introduction. Um, that's a pretty complete copy of my bio. But I tell you what, one thing that you can't really write on a piece of paper is taking the mindset out of the entrepreneurial school focus and just putting on your work boots and going out and working. And it's, it's funny, I heard there's a bunch of cosmetology folks and the guys from the oil change uh, company were here. And 
Interestingly enough, like I don't know anything about haircutting, but when I go get my haircut, I want to know everything that the barber's got to know or the haircutter's got to know before they do the job. And I'm not a great student, and I'll tell you about my schooling history um, in a little bit. But have you guys heard of balayage, the latest craze in haircutting? Well, I always used to joke around or I get my hair painted, and people are like, yeah, 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 well, you do foils or you do the cap, which is the most painful thing ever. They stab you in the head a hundred times and pull it through a piece of silicone. Well, the latest ingredient is balayage, and I tell you one thing, the hairdresser's proud of her work, but when it's done, it looks all right. I'm going in a couple days to get it finished, so um, it's funny because when you look at anything, whether it's like sitting down in the chair to get your hair done or it's working the guys that were talking about the business with the uh, oil changes, so we drive our trucks 170,000 miles a year per truck, so they need a lot of oil changes, like almost weekly oil changes. The funny thing is when the truck's in the shop for an oil changer for a repair job, it costs a fortune because that downtime is so expensive. So to have someone come out to my office when I'm there not using the truck is a lot more cost effective than taking the truck in and taking the truck out of service to be in the service center. So even if it takes half a day, half a day is lost revenue that costs me and our employees the ability to continue growing business. So. To start the presentation, I was asking before, did you guys call this thing Illuminate Your Pathway because we make lights for fire trucks? And they didn't, but that's actually what we do. Now, you know, my business is manufacturing scene lighting solutions that go on fire trucks. And I'll explain that later. We'll go outside, we'll play with the fire trucks. But um, so who invited me? Like, why do I have anything to tell you guys about business or schooling? I'm a high school dropout, not a great student, but I'm a hard worker. I got my good enough diploma. I finally got that piece of paper and have taken community college classes and there's value in education. So I don't want to make the story that, oh, education is not the way to succeed. Education is the key to succeeding. The traditional sitting there in a classroom didn't work great for me, but sitting in the chair at the barber shop, I take an hour to learn why balayage and the French style haircuts taking over and we're not no, no longer the UK or the British style. I mean, whatever it is. So the government knows that I've had five businesses because I pay taxes on five of them, but there's a whole lot more micro businesses that have transpired over the years as I've been doing things. Um, from snow removal, you'll see some of this stuff up, up on the upper left. Um, and then down to the latest business venture is called Haas Alert, and we're basically taking automotive data mapping and we're putting a signal in a car that says there's a fire truck behind you and we're rerouting ways and we're telling the world, hey, here's where emergency services providers are. And so from pushing snow to using the Internet of Things to alert motorists of emergency vehicles, anything that you really put your mind to can become a business. I got to start pretty early. Um, when I was, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12, I was in second grade, and I sent an email to this company called Thomas Buses. And Thomas Bus makes school buses. You guys may have been familiar with them. They're in High Point, North Carolina. Uh, but I lived in D.C. at the time, and I was a student in a school system called Fairfax County Schools. They were a new customer of Thomas Bus. We had one get delivered one day, uh, and the school bus had some function of the door that I thought was interesting. And I went online and noticed that the website didn't match the function of the new truck. So I emailed over from my little, I'm like eight years old, but I had an AOL account my dad had set up, Talkie at AOL.com. So I shoot a message over, hey guys, this is Sam from, you know, I go to school at Fairfax County Schools, got this bus, I noticed it's got this door. It doesn't match what's, uh, what's on your website, what do you reckon? And they were like, oh my goodness, well, biggest customer of ours in the nation, we want to have you into our facility and come learn a little about it. Well, I showed up and I was eight years old. They thought I was a staff member at the school. I, my dad takes me down to the facility. This is John Thomas III. This is the guy that started his whole family lineage back in the 20s, started the Pearly A. Thomas Car Works, and then they started building school buses. So they host me at the factory, because I'm some little kid that's interested in school buses, but I was interested enough to reach out and developed a relationship with the company very early on. And this wasn't necessarily a business, but it was a great introduction to the business world. So when I moved down my schooling career, I wasn't a great student. I'm a dyslexic that has all sorts of different learning disabilities. I can barely write my name sometimes. I mean, shoot, until a couple years ago, I'd pull my ID out to figure out how to spell my middle name because I never use it for anything. So in North Carolina, everyone uses it for their first name, but I tell you what, in DC, that thing is rare. So anyway, so I wasn't a great student, but what I did enjoy was things like the school bus. When Miss Barry bought the new bus, I enjoyed engaging in that type of technology, learning about the door, reaching out to the company. And I'm like, I don't know the technical term for what you call it, but at least it was something I was interested in. And so I've always been um, into the business mindset without really having formal training, but going from thinking about school buses to thinking about ways to make money to watching the teacher at field day talk about PA systems. I mean, they had, you guys, I remember in second or third grade, you go down to the field and they've got the kids running relays. And at our school, they had a lady that sat there with the speakers and, and was the DJ. So I watched her do that one day. I said, well, man, she's getting paid to stand there and play music off of, at the time, a CD. I'm sure I can do that. And I wanted to learn out how to buy one and, and build a business around it. So when I was, I don't know, probably 
10 or 11, maybe 12, after the school bus deal, I uh, started mowing grass and doing what kids do to make a dollar. I don't know what you can do, wash cars and sell lemonade. And uh, I started this business, micro business, DJing in the school system. And the way I started it was like invite all my friends over for a birthday party. I barely had a stereo, I mean, I probably raised $50. But I invite all the friends over, and I wasn't a super popular kid in school, but they came to my birthday party that was DJed, and that was a big deal when I was you know, a kid. So they're all sitting there watching the DJ do it. Well, really, I'm thinking, let's market to these kids. So there's a bunch of kids that are eventually gonna be old enough to have a sweet 16 and a high school grad party or whatever. So I started this little business as a kid through my friends, DJing in the school system, uh, and I learned about the technology, just like sitting in the barber's chair, I learned about how the equipment worked and how to use it and how to market it uh, and got some certifications and eventually this little business started and I called it Massive Productions. So the, um, let's see if I can jump forward. There you go, Massive Productions. So we were a preferred vendor in Fairfax County Schools and I'm like, you know, at the time that this is middle school, 13 years old. So I'd sit there and not enjoy class. I wasn't a great student, but I had the opportunity to provide the PA system and lighting and sound support for the school system when I was a student. And the funny thing was that the um, end of quarter events they had every year, you had to have great grades. Well, I didn't necessarily have great grades, but I was interested in the school and I was learning. Um, but they had this deal where if you didn't have a high enough thing, you had to sit in study hall. And the funniest story was I'd loaded all this gear and I was gonna be the DJ for the event. The school teacher told me, not nah, you gotta go to the study hall, you didn't have enough grade to go to the dance. Meanwhile, I'm the DJ, so I go down and I give her my little ticket, sorry, I got a D in algebra or whatever it was. And the principal comes over to the PA, Sam Massa, I need you to report to the DJ event because like, you're the DJ of this thing. So anyway, so I go down there and, uh, and start the event, do the deal, and afterwards they pay me for it. So this little business was just something in school that I was doing because I didn't really enjoy being in class and I wanted an excuse to get out and work a little bit, but I was able to do it. I created a little business and as opportunities presented, I just picked them up. So like you were talking about before, there's things that as an opportunity shows up, you're like, well, that's a good idea or maybe it's an okay idea. It doesn't have to be the best idea. It's something you enjoy. If you can get a little bit excited about it, it could be cutting hair, it could be changing oil, it could be DJing. At the time, I knew nothing about DJing, but I thought, well, that's a cool speaker. I'm interested in learning more about it. So through my high school career and middle and high school career, obviously when you're 14 years old you can't drive, um, but I'd always had the interest in school buses from the early days and I had this little business that I started. When I was 14 years old, I bought my first vehicle, it was a school bus. And the school, I mean, like you can't drive the thing, so how do you get this thing around? So I hired a couple guys, they're local high school kids, to drive the school bus to our functions around Fairfax County as the preferred sound and lighting vendor, and we had a handicap lift on the side. So to get around, there was a CDL requirement for a passenger vehicle with 15 or more seats in it, and there was 17 in the bus, whatever it was. So we yank all the seats out and use the lift so that it, it's registered like a box truck, not like a school bus. So we get around the regulation. My buddies don't need a CDL to drive it because it doesn't have air brakes. And uh, hired these couple of guys to drive the bus around. And starting in this business, as things are growing, I'm connecting a passion, which was the school bus thing, which didn't ever make any money. But then when I'm looking for a vehicle, it's like, well, this would be kind of cool. I'd love to drive a school bus around. Let's go ahead and do it. So for 500 bucks, I scrounged up the cash and bought the thing on eBay, put it in service, and continued to grow the business. And uh, it was just neat that it sort of tied back to that deal there. So about age 16, you know, you start driving, you start getting interested in driving, and I was planning for my second vehicle, um, and I really wanted to buy this big H1 Hummer, the big diesel truck, it's actually sitting in the parking lot, so I get a little ahead of myself, but the, um, this thing's a little bit out of sync, there we go. So I asked my dad, hey man, will you, you know, are you gonna buy me a car when I turn 16? And he just laughed, and he was like, no way, definitely not an H1 Hummer, not even a Civic, so go put your work boots on, keep DJ, do whatever, if you want it. He made me an, a, a birthday cake to look like a Hummer, and he said, yeah, yeah. So the first vehicle was a school bus, the second vehicle, I scrounged the money, grew the business, and bought the truck. So it was pretty cool. When you look at this, this guy here, it's hard to see on the screen, this is a guy named Jose Pastrana, and I'll bring him up in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that when you talk about the entrepreneurial spirit, and illuminating your pathway, following your dreams, you always gotta make sure not to burn bridges. So sometimes things don't go your way, but you wanna make sure you treat people right. And I think that among any other character trait or anything else you learn, if you treat people correctly, then you'll be rewarded in business. So like golden rule, call it whatever you wanna call it. But I think that this guy in particular, I'll tell you why in a minute, we treated him right when I bought the truck. The truck had a problem, wasn't a big deal. He fixed it, man of his word. And it paid off for him later because he ended up needing a job and I'll, and I'll go through that. 
So when we were talking about this business, I bought the truck, again, for fun, because it's something to do when you're 16 years old, it'd be cool to drive a Hummer to high school, right? So the problem was you spend $35,000 a year in fuel driving a truck around that gets four miles to the gallon, and it's really expensive. So I was driving it to school, I figured I could write the fuel off by branding it for the business. So when you go back to that first slide, let me see if I can pull it back up, and you look at our logos. So, oh, come on, thing. Used to use a truck, put the Hummer logo on it, put the picture on the side of the rig, now I can write off the fuel, I can write off the expense, it's not a personal vehicle, it's a business vehicle. So I can save some money and now I get to drive without feeling so bad about it. The only problem was at the time I'm in high school and I was in a public school for a while and I went to a little private school because I wasn't super great at uh, fitting in with the norm of the public school and the private school didn't work much better. But nonetheless, I had a teacher, this school was a very, um, oh, I don't know, Northern Virginia DC mindset school that was very concerned about the environment, not very concerned about teaching students much of anything useful. So I had a teacher that was, she used to work for Greenpeace, she sailed around the world, the craziest stories, the coolest lady, we're still friends to this day, but she tells me you're single-handedly destroying the planet, burning that much diesel fuel, you've got to quit. And I'm like, all right, listen, I can't quit driving this truck because this thing rocks and I don't really care about the fuel and da da da, we were making the money with the, with the business. And she said, well, I can save you all that money if you'll just burn cooking oil. My cooking oil, that's crazy. So she sends me an article she read in some Green Fleet magazine that says, oh, biodiesel, where you take vegetable oil and you chemically alter it, you remove the glycerin and you insert an alcohol molecule and you're pumping methanol and lye around, you can make diesel fuel out of cooking oil. I'm like, all right, well, I don't really wanna do that. How much is it? Oh, 10 cents a gallon. Well, now when diesel's 5.39 a gallon, I'm interested. So I took this fuel burning heavy vehicle, took a teacher's advice to try something for an economic benefit that the whole world was pushing for the ecologic benefit, married the two together and created a business out of it. So I started, whoops, flipped through. So as we went through that school year, I started this little micro business in school, like let's make some diesel fuel, see how it works. The problem is when you pump methanol and you pump lye and you're moving this stuff around, if the pump isn't grounded and you're pumping a flammable substance, it will catch on fire. So I did this in school, caught our school lab on fire. We're making a little batch, like 50 gallons diesel fuel. They called it an apple seed processor. Well, it was a very flammable apple seed processor. So I thought, no way, scrap this business idea. I can't make the fuel. It's not going to burn my truck. I'm just going to keep driving it, DJing and doing whatever. But then as technology evolves and you hear about things in the industry, someone mentioned that you can physically alter the vegetable oil instead of chemically alter the vegetable oil. So I went out to this company in, I can't remember where it was, somewhere in the middle of the country, and these guys had these fuel systems for old Mercedes diesel vehicles where they would use heat to physically alter the viscosity of the oil. So if any of you guys are in the, in the automotive world, you think about old, dirty, used, cold engine oil, and then you think about gasoline or water. The water is real runny and the oil is really thick and heavy. So similarly, the reason you can't burn vegetable oil in a diesel motor has nothing to do with the chemical makeup. It really has everything to do with the physical property. It's too thick. You can't pump it and you can't easily inject it because when you inject it into an automotive in fuel injector, it's under 4,500 to 20,000 PSI. It's got to turn into little droplets that are highly flammable. Well, you can't pump toothpaste through a fuel injector. So you can either remove the glycerin or you can physically alter it and heat it. So that's what this other company, by physically altering it, you're not pumping methanol and lye, you don't have the flammability issue, and you convert the vehicle one time, not every single gallon of fuel you burn. So I thought, wow, that's a cool technology. I wonder if it's applicable in this type of vehicle, because these were all designed for small Mercedes that were people driving around saving the planet. And I wasn't candidly interested in saving the planet, I was interested in driving the Hummer around to high school. So after developing this relationship with the company that created the, the fuel system, and I wasn't the, the guy that came up with it, I thought, well, there'd be a really big business in automating the process, because you have to start the engine, you gotta get it hot, you gotta switch a valve, and I thought, well, if I just come up with a way to automate that, I could put that in fleets, and fleet owners that don't care about the environment do care about the bottom line. So if you can take something and make it applicable to a market that wouldn't normally think about it, I was developing fuel systems for large fleet trucks, so I finally said, all right, this school's getting in my way, I gotta get out of here and go get into business, so I got my good enough diploma, got the test, signed it off, and went to the, the fuel system business. Um, and the funny thing is, so you think about business people, a lot of times it's thinking left brain, it's thinking out of the box. Well, in order to get your GED in the state of Virginia where I did it, you have to, if you're under 18, you have to go to a class before the before the deal, you know, before they let you test. So I go in and you take a pretest and they teach you the things that you didn't do well on. Well, luckily enough, I passed that pretest with like a 99%. Didn't need to go to the class for six months, but they said you do have to at least come back for a job interview. There's a mock interview because they wanted to teach you some life skills. 
So I thought, fair enough, I'll go interview these people and we'll see how it goes. So the teachers were all sitting there at the panel and I walked in for the mock interview before I'm gonna take the test and I'm like, all right guys, so here's what we do and I'm just curious, did you guys all bring your resumes? And they're like, we're interviewing you. I'm like, you're interviewing me? I got the EIN, the employee identification number, what's yours? And they're like, well, it doesn't work like that. I'm like, it actually does work like that because when I leave here, I'm gonna go do this other business, this is my mission, and they were like, well, I guess fair enough, and they weren't expecting it. So, you know, you, you kind of got to think outside the box sometimes, and when you look at the entrepreneurial drive and spirit, it's always about getting out there and getting it done. I wasn't dropping out of school to go sit there and eat bonbons. I was exiting the school industry because I had a better opportunity that showed up in business. So, as we bounced down the line of fuel systems and others, like they said before, you know, I got the opportunity to work on Arnold Schwarzenegger's personal fleet of H1 Hummers. I ran this business for a few years. This is a guy that used to work for me, that's John, uh, and then that's me down the bottom, and that's the fuel system on the truck and pumping just straight vegetable oil out of an Arby's fuel, you know, can out the back. They used to dump the oil into these big tanks, they call them par cans. So I'd pump it out of the par can into the back of the truck and then we'd filter it and put it in the gas tank. So that business was interesting because at some point I had to hire someone that could understand the diesel motor without being a fuel systems expert. That Jose fellow that was in the picture before used to work at Global Humber in Florida and they went out of business. And there weren't that many dealers left because AM General stopped building the H1 line. And he was looking for a job. Now people didn't take me seriously when I walked into a fleet of garbage trucks and said, hey, listen, I can save you all this money. I can cut your fuel system costs in half and you know, reduce your operating deal. They said, okay, well, what do you know about a diesel motor? I don't know nothing about a diesel motor. I know something about a fuel system. And they're like, why am I gonna trust? A garbage truck's $190,000 if you buy a new one today. So why am I gonna trust you with my garbage truck? Well, they wouldn't. So what I did was I hired Jose, who knew nothing about a fuel system, a few things about a diesel motor and had gray hair. And when Jose sat in the room, they'd say, what do you know about a fuel system? And Jose would say, oh, you know, this guy here, Sam, I can vouch for him and it's good. We paid the guy $70,000 a year to vouch for me. That's all he did. But that's how the business grew. So the worst fuel system installer you'll ever meet in your entire life, but the greatest asset to our business, because we had to have someone that could see that the technology worked, could give the relationship advice to the customer who needed someone that understood their fleet truck and the value of that truck and uh, for Jose it worked out well he moved up to DC and worked for me for a few years because we needed someone that could do that role and he could fill the role and, and I wasn't able to do it so sometimes you might find something you're really good at you might find something you're not really good at and I always say you can learn to do something you're not good at or you can hire someone to do it for you I usually take the hire someone to do it for you approach if I can't learn it myself I try and learn it myself but sometimes I'll learn enough to hire someone that can do it better or faster so massive green enterprises we spilled a lot of oil made a lot of fleets really happy, and we made a lot of messes. So the one thing I did not like about that business was that it was, it was extremely dirty. Talk about like the climbing in the back, this is a, let me show you the next slide, this is a septic tank, 4,400 gallons of sewage normally sits in those, in those tanks. So we made a relationship with this company called Five Star Septic, and they had big vacuum trucks, and they'd drive around town and they'd pump, you know, septic tanks most of the time. We wanted the fuel out of these park cans. The problem is if you pump it and there's particulate in it, it ruins the pumps. So we thought, well, we'll use these vac trucks and we'll suck the fuel up and then we'll settle it in these tanks. And instead of passively or actively filtering it, we're passively settling the particulate out of it, which is, this is what you can see on the bottom. But in order to get that septic truck to go from pumping sewage to pumping vegetable oil, you have to clean it. So I got to put on a Tyvek suit with a sprayer and go inside and spray the inside of a 10,000 gallon truck or an 8,000 gallon truck, however big these things were. And that was disgusting. So sometimes you enjoy what you do, sometimes you don't enjoy what you do. I found very quickly there was something that I did not enjoy doing was cleaning the inside of septic trucks. The funny thing is that guy is one of the most affluent business owners I know in the DC area. The guy's made a fortune because fire trucks and septic trucks or septic business, you're always gonna be in business. People always have to use the restroom and stuff always catches on fire. It doesn't matter what happens with the economy. Right. Economy can go up or down, but there's some things that are no question. So, oh, I can't afford to buy the fire truck. Oh, well, Johnny's in the house and he just got burned up. You're gonna find out how to buy the fire trucks. You're not gonna let Johnny burn up. And you're definitely not gonna have sewage running through your classroom. So before they repaint the inside of the building, they're gonna make sure the septic man comes and fixes the sewer. So there's some things that I always enjoyed finding. I didn't enjoy working in the trucks, but I enjoyed finding people that did. These are just some pictures of the company and the stuff we used to do. These are old school buses. This thing here, this is a guy that worked for us too. Um, that's, that's a tank of vegetable oil and we'd heat it in the shop and then we'd centrifuge it and spin all the particulate out to the outside and grab what was left in the middle. It would cost us about eight cents a gallon. We'd sell it for half the cost of diesel and lock a customer in for five years. So they'd buy diesel for five and a half dollars a gallon today. So we'd say, okay, for $2.25, we'll sell you diesel fuel for your fleet. 
and that was a very profitable business, but I didn't enjoy doing it. So that's Jose right there. So he came back to work for us. He was uh, the fuel system technician that didn't know anything about fuel systems, <laughs> but a heck of a nice guy. So the cool thing was I got to work on these Hummers, and I got to work on trucks that I liked, and I got to work on big trucks, small trucks, whatever it was, and it was an interesting business. I didn't love it, and finally, when it was time to exit, I bid that business goodbye. So during my pursuit of school and business and other stuff, of course, you do things for work and you do things for play. So I enjoyed water skiing, I enjoyed playing the cello, I enjoyed rock climbing, but water skiing was something I thought, well, this might be kind of fun to do, and I did it for a while, and when I finally sold that vegetable oil business, which I did not make a lot of money on, because it was, it was a profitable business, but sometimes you make money and you lose money, well, that one was a make and lose situation for me, unfortunately, but you always gotta put your boots back on and get back up. So I enjoyed water skiing, and so when I got out of that other business, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go live behind a barn, at a water ski school, go do this for fun, it doesn't really matter, I have no expenses, and that's in Lillington. That's why I ended up in North Carolina, was pursuing a passion in water skiing that wasn't a business, but it was something I enjoyed doing. So the only problem is, when I'm living in a barn behind a ski school, I don't really have connectivity to the world, and I don't really have this business, I don't have a facility anymore, but people would still reach out and call me. And so I kept getting calls from AM General, and they're like, hey, we have this customer, it's really important to us, we really want them to you know, do this fuel system, or we want you to do this fuel system for them. And AM General used to build the H1 Hummers, that's the original parent company. So I told AM General Pound Sand, have this guy call me, if he's that important, he can pick up the phone and call me. No, 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 he won't do it. I'm like, well then tell the guy I'm not doing his fuel system, there's not enough money in the world to pay me to go out there and do it. I don't like getting covered in stuff. So finally, one day I'm at the gun show walking around in Raleigh with a buddy of mine, the guy from the ski school, and the phone rings, and it's like, this is the governor of California's office. We have a message for you. I'm like, yeah, well, I hope I paid my taxes. And it's Arnold Schwarzenegger on the other line. So they transfer me over and says, hey, you know, I want a $10,000 sticker for my truck, or I want a fuel system for my truck, and I tell him it's gonna cost him 10 grand. He's like, well, I really want the sticker, but I guess I'll buy the fuel system if you need it. So this is actually the back of his truck. This is what he was after. Media coverage that said his vehicle ran on recycled vegetable oil. The problem was he didn't want to lie to anybody. So we reduced his carbon footprint, put the sticker on his truck. We did this whole project around centrifuge fuel systems and this automated switching. AM General didn't know about it. They actually owned the truck at the time. So AM General wanted to connect the two of us. AM General did not want me to convert that truck. But the funny thing was we did that truck and then he ended up having to buy it from him, which was funny. So he's got 11 of those things and they all have our fuel system on them now. So he drives around the country and um, with a fuel system that says powered by vegetable oil, fuel system by Sam Massa on the back. So that was kind of a highlight of that career. It wasn't something I was interested in doing. I was willing to say no to it because I didn't like doing it. But when he called, I thought it might be an opportunity too good to turn down. So I did, told no warranty. I'll fly out there tomorrow and do it. And we ended up next day in parts and flying out and doing it. So that was kind of a neat thing. So when I got back from that, still living at the ski school, I get this um, call from some other customers. Hey, we want to buy light bars, you know, the customers used to bring their Hummers in, their off-road vehicles, and they wanted to add accessories, lift kits, tires, wheels, and some of the guys used to buy light bars. And we had a contact that would import them from China, and they were garbage, but in the off-road automotive market, no one really cared. So I got the itch to get back into business. I'm tired of living at the barn behind the ski school. It was a lot of fun, but eventually, like, I just had to get back out there and do it. So I had this business, another little side job that was plowing snow in the wintertime, um, and I wanted to bring these lights in and, and plow snow with the lights, and I thought maybe I could sell to other snow plow companies and they'll buy the lights from me. So out of the other one business, still kept my contacts, don't burn the bridge, reached back out and said, hey, can you get me some of these lights again? So I brought a bunch of them in. The problem was that they were garbage, and so when they'd come in, they'd fail, and in the commercial market space, the cost of downtime was worth more than that little fixture was. So we ended up having to come up with a better way to do it. I had to take care of my customers, not burn those bridges, and figure out how to warranty them. And when I talk about the next business we're in now, which is the fire truck lighting business, it was the entire reason we make lights for fire trucks is because I messed up and was importing garbage that didn't work. So there's a funny side story about this particular enterprise. If you talk about you know, what do you do, you wanna find a business when an opportunity presents. So think about snow plowing, and, and here's a little different. Think about snow plowing in DC or in New York or in somewhere where it actually snows. It's not very profitable, it's like mowing the grass. It's like, okay, I gotta go plow 400 parking lots because it's super expensive uh, you know, to have all the trucks. It's gonna be, you know, they don't pay that much. So what I did was instead of plowing snow in DC, I plowed snow in Atlanta, I lived in DC. But if you drive to Atlanta and you're in the middle of the city when this whole city shuts down because it snows, you're the only guy with no contracts in the city. So I took a bigger risk for a bigger reward. Little risk in DC, I could have plowed parking lots all day, put a lot of wear and tear on the trucks, it wouldn't have been that profitable. Big risk, it might not snow very often, but if it does snow and I'm in the center of the city when it gets shut down, no one else can get in and it's supply and demand, basic economics. 
So I didn't take an economics class, but I got paid $25,000 in 12 hours to drive around in the Hummer and plow snow in the city of Atlanta. CBS News covered it. That's one of the stories on the right. And it was insane. And it was like, wait a minute, this is how I got the seed capital to fund that lighting business was just plowing snow. I bought the snow plow for $1,000 from a friend of mine, had to weld a bracket to make it work. And it was like lawnmower money to, to buy the plow. But I took the risk and drove to Atlanta. And when that snowstorm hit, that's where the high vis LEDs fire tech brand started and got its seed funding. So you talk about like, oh, I don't have the money to start a business. Well, a lot of times it doesn't take a lot of cash to start a business. It takes a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of drive and a lot of tries. So, I, you know, there's even things like, I mean, I had a little business painting lawnmowers and selling them. Buy a lawnmower on Craigslist for a hundred bucks paint it, put a spark plug in it, and sell it for 250. I paid off my first house selling lawnmowers that way. It was side business. But you think about it like, it's easy to scrounge a couple hundred bucks. So take a couple hundred bucks and get creative with it. Get to the center of the storm when the city shuts down, or figure out a way to make it economically viable. So the ecologic benefit to the fuel systems was not gonna pay for anybody to do the work, but the economic side was. So that's kind of a, uh, just an anecdote and a mindset to think of. That's how I started the lighting business. So got into plowing snow and moved from there get through this little couple of slides. Got a video to show you, here we go. So this is my buddy Bubba. So get this lighting business going, I've got the lights, go down to Florida, I'm talking to the towing market. They've got this big trade show in Florida every year and I'm like, oh yeah, these guys, they gotta have good lights because at this point I've burned the snowplow market, I've developed a relationship with a company called Vision X in Seattle and was replacing the snowplow lights that failed with decent quality lights from this company called Vision and thought the towing market was gonna be the place to do it. So you talk about, you know, you see these light bars on a Jeep, you buy one on Amazon for 40 bucks, we were selling a $2,000 light bar that looked the exact same. So I had to find a market that could justify the cost of that, of that component piece. So this guy, I show him the thing, see if I can get it to play. This is the best light ever invented. This guy didn't know me from a hole in the ground. He never bought anything from me. I don't even know if he had any money. But when I put that on our website, people were like, oh, yeah, that guy looks like a tow truck driver. That guy obviously looks like he knows what he's doing. He was at the tow show. I don't know if he was a driver, an owner, an operator. I have no idea what the guy did. But I put a light on him and told him I'd take his video, and the guy gave me a great testimonial. So take the opportunity. You can, you can tote productions equipment around, and you can make a nice video that costs you a fortune, or you can grab an iPhone or your buddy's phone or whatever and shoot a quick video. That was on my iPhone. And that was what we used as our testimonial to qualify our business. Some guy with a light bolted to his forehead that said he could remove a drive shaft. So the funniest thing was the towing market was not a very easy market to get into because they were just as happy with the light bolted to their forehead as they were a $3,000 light bar in the back of their truck. And the guy's like, well, I mean, this does. It brightens my job. I can see to pull the drive shaft. So why do I need to buy your expensive light bar? Ah, shoot. That's not what I wanted to hear. It was very successful in launching the business and giving me great reputation with our customers. It wasn't very successful in helping drive sales. So I was looking for other markets. And um, I want to make sure I'm still on time. How much time do I have? I'm good? Okay, cool. So I was looking for other markets. This is where I'll start talking about like the modern, modern business. So I was like in high school before and a kid. I didn't really know anything about business. But at this point, it's like, all right, now I actually have to get serious. I'm like 22 years old or 24 years old, whatever it was. And I had to figure out a way to actually make some money because I had to live in my house. And eventually, you got to pay bills. And eventually, the tax man wants you to pay him. And anyway. Um, lived in this little town at the time, still living behind the water ski school, and this guy tells me, this mechanic fella, hey, you know, the fire truck guys, they have a life safety driver. So if that light goes out and the guy can't see to cut someone out of a vehicle, the person can die. So there's a very important benefit to having that light operational, and when you can tie life safety or you can tie economics to something, now they're willing to pay for it. So the problem was that Vision Manufacturing built off-road light bars for race cars. That people that had too much money and not enough sense, they'd buy these light bars. They wouldn't bolt to a fire truck. There's some, there's some electrical system things that make it difficult. And there's some other things. When you look at the, um, get the first slide up. So when you get the first, when you get the technology into the, into the industry, you get feedback, right? So if you're taking balayage to the small town in the middle of nowhere and you're saying, hey, you know, this is the best, latest and greatest, you gotta be able to explain the difference between a European style and a French style and a this and a that. And if you can't explain the difference, then no one's gonna take you seriously. So I walked in the room to this fire truck demo. This good old boy tells me the fire truck guys have the money to spend and they need a life safety. So I think, oh, well, the helmet lights were important in towing, so I'll bring a helmet light to the fire truck market because these guys all wear helmets. And maybe that'll be the best way to start in this industry and I'll learn a little bit about what people do. The problem was, when I take that helmet light to the fire market and I cut it on a room like this full of fire chiefs, the guy from the back of the room pipes up and goes, you don't know a darn thing about the fire service because if you cut that light on in a room full of smoke, the whole room's gonna go white. 
like a light bulb went off. I'm thinking, you ever driven in the fog, cut your high beams on? Yeah, same problem. So I put my tail between my legs, leave this demo, and there's like 50 fire chiefs in there. This is the big launch of the high vis lighting brand of the fire market, and it didn't go very well. So the fire chief uh, from the back of the room pipes up and tells me this, and he meets me outside afterwards and says, listen, man, there's a lot I can teach you about the industry. I don't know anything about lights, but I can at least teach you about how to be a fireman if you want to go learn this, this deal. And then maybe you can use that real world training, because if you've never been in a building full of smoke, you have no idea how the environment feels. You don't know about stratification of the layers and you don't see dense particulate. And so I took that opportunity because I had nothing better to do at the time and I had plenty of energy and excitement about this business to go join the fire academy downtown, went through six months of training and, and learned the fire market from the perspective of a fireman instead of from the perspective of a salesman. So when I brought the light to the room, it didn't work. But after I went inside, I learned the industry and really learned what mattered. So when you're on the side of the road at two in the morning and you've got a million dollar fire truck behind you and the lights are shining behind you and you're looking into a shadow, then it makes sense, ah, oh, maybe the problem isn't the light at the source, it's the light on the target and I should figure this out. So it, it takes a while to do the fire training and it takes a lot longer to do EMS training. I did my EMT training online, it's like a vocational school. So you can go through Lenore College, I'm sure these colleges have these EMS credentialing schools. Let me just tell you one thing, that's one class you don't really want to take online because I didn't learn a whole lot on the internet. Uh, but the good news is when you get put in the field, you get partnered with someone that's been there for 20 years. So I learned the majority of that trade by doing. My first call on an ambulance, I'm sitting there and the, uh, the guy at the medic says, hey, I need you know, this or that. I don't even know what that is, it's not in my scope. And he's like, oh yeah, but it's in mine, I need you to hand it to me. So it's important that you take the opportunity to, to learn as much as you can. Um, but learning that industry from the perspective of listening to guys that have done it, or from the schooling, or from the academy, uh, is really important if you want to develop a business. It could be hair, I mean, go get your hair cut at five different places. You learn it in school, go test out a few of them. You'll learn from the people that are in the industry. So my first call ever, this is not on the ambulance, this is the first EMT call, Donnie Suggs was a mentor, the same chief at the back of the room. He tells me, you know, it's gonna be important for you to develop your business through real world experience. So I get my certificate in the mail that day and it's like, you know, welcome to the world of EMTs and I'm super excited. So later that night, the pager goes off. Let's fast forward a little bit. Yep, yeah, first, first call ever, pager goes off, I got my credentials so I can ride the truck. We show up to the scene, Donnie's been this mentor, this guy at the back of the room is a fire chief, puts me through the academy, teaches me about why he does things in the industry, and we get to the house, and it's Donnie on the ground in cardiac arrest. It's like the first time I've ever done CPR, the first time I've ever done anything in the fire service related to the medical profession, and it's my mentor that's taught me about the fire industry and given me the, the excitement and energy to chase this market. So he says, you don't know a damn thing, sorry about the language, about the fire service, come on down to the station, I'll teach you a thing. And what I really didn't put two and two together was that his whole life story centered around teaching people, whether it's fire service or it's lighting or it's whatever, he was a mentor and a really great person. So you wanna find people in your life that can be mentors, because you don't know when they're gonna go away. And I learned a lot from Donnie through that whole training experience, and including when Donnie died, that cardiac arrest, it was, it was eye-opening. The guys in the fire service sometimes do things that don't make sense, and you don't understand it unless you've been there, and you've actually been on the side of the road, and you've worked cardiac arrest, you've talked to the wise, you've been there and actually experienced it. So it was really tough losing a friend and a mentor, but I had to make the commitment now at that point that I was gonna see this business through because he'd taken the time to show me a lot about the industry. You don't know anything about the fire service? Well, I learned a little bit about the fire service and I realized there's a need for the technology, and he was interested enough to teach me a little bit about it, so I thought I would give back. So now, we manufacture lighting solutions for the fire market, and we don't do it because we like lights. We do it because we have these lights problems and all this deal. No, we do it because I learned the industry from the perspective of a fireman, had a great mentor that taught me a lot of things about it, and now I've got a commitment to see it through. So whatever your driver is, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, you like cutting hair, you like changing oil, you like doing whatever. Find a reason to get excited about it, get passionate about it, and go do it. So now our business is a manufacturer of scene lighting solutions. There's only four of them in the US that actually build the parts that we make. They're put on fire trucks all over the world, distributed into 170 countries. We've got about 40 employees that work for us in the US and about 170 globally that are contract employees. Business today is so disjointed, I don't even have to hire them myself. So I can contract with companies that can provide the employee base, the manufacturing base, the warehousing, the facilities. And so my wife and I live in Hendersonville, North Carolina now because we like the mountains, not because we have to have our factory there, but we travel all over the world and we build and sell these scene lighting solutions that go on fire trucks. So this is our, our little marketing video that shows actually what we do. It does have some sound, I don't know if you can click it. Cool. Maybe it doesn't have some sound. I'm not a good singer so I won't try. 
So if you look at the front of these trucks, I mean, this is pretty cool. So we build this white light that goes in the front of the cab. We build the side lights in the front of that rig. These were all delivered you know, in the last year or so. And what's interesting about it is when you think about the technology, you think about what it actually does, there's a purpose behind it. So you know, if you dig a ditch, dig the best ditch you've ever dug in your life every time you do it. Otherwise, go do something else. And when I interview for the position at the EMS agency that I worked or I work anywhere, it's like my job is to do this correctly. My job is to get excited about it. And if I'm not excited about it, then I can go do something else. I can go DJ. I can go do whatever. And similarly, you can too. It's not like once you do your training, you're locked into a box. That box can be expanded. You can shift it. Now we're doing, I was talking about that Haas alert company that creates these data messages that's in between fire trucks. I learned the industry of a fireman from the perspective of a user created a business in lighting, but now I'm expanding that market because lighting is you know, only one piece of the industry. Now I'm touching digital traffic preemption and I'm touching safety standards. And there's a, there's a group of people that get together, she mentioned before, called the NFPA 1901 Technical Standards Committee. I can barely read and write my own name, but I can sit there and pin this language that gets adopted by the national governing body for fire apparatus manufacturers. And they sit there and listen to me tell them why scene lights are a good idea or how much light needs to go on a target. Our competitors have been in the industry for 100 years, literally 100 years. I mean, they're like founded in the 1800s. So when we enter this market space, I'm a young guy. I'm not an engineer. I don't have a huge team behind me. I'm not a $100 million business. We're a small company. But we have the passion and drive to learn the industry, to get out there and get dirty. And so when I show you later, up, you know, when we go outside, the one thing you can always do is be more creative than your competitor. You don't have to have the biggest checkbook, but you can always be the hardest worker and the best innovator. So when we go outside, I'll show you those demo trucks. All the lighting systems on those trucks, you could, you could put a button, you could turn a light on and you could turn a light off, and that's not very exciting. And all of our competitors put a light on the side of their truck, and they turn them on and they turn them off. There's 4,500 fire trucks built in the US every year. The market's not growing, it's marginally growing. But nonetheless, we're doubling in size every quarter, and our competitors are losing the business to us because we're more creative. So when you go out there and look at the trucks, they're all automated. I took a totally left brain thought and said, okay, well, I've seen these Christmas light controllers that make the lights on the houses, and everyone, you get 10 million views on YouTube if you have a cool Christmas light display. So I thought, we make lights, maybe I can take this Christmas lighting controller and figure out how to attach it to a fire truck electrical system, marry the two up and take it to a trade show, people will get excited about the technology because it's cool, just like people watch a YouTube video. And for, I mean, the Christmas light boards are 200 bucks. This isn't even big money. We attach it to the truck and now it's an automated display. We make the same types of technologies as our competitors. We apply it to the market space differently. We understand why it makes sense and we can show it off in some way that's kind of cool and innovative. It's not rocket science, but it's a lot of hard work and it's, and it's paying off in growth. So I'll leave you with a quote. This is Theodore Roosevelt. So he said in a speech in 1911 or some long time ago, it's not the critic who counts. I've actually got to read it. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena. His face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Who strives valiantly who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end triumph and high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So you've got to put your boots on, you've got to go out there, you're not always gonna win. I've lost as much as I've made, and I've been fortunate in our current business that it's growing and it's profitable, but you gotta go out there and get in the arena. If you're not in the arena, you're not gonna go anywhere because you're gonna be sitting at a desk. So later on, we'll go outside and play with trucks, but I appreciate you guys having me come in. Thank you for the, the time and be glad to answer any questions. Does anybody have any burning questions for Sam right now? If not, be thinking of some, we'll add it into our, our panel discussion, but anyone have like a dying question right now? Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you, guys. Yes, thank you. For sure. Thank you so much. Our next portion of the, of the event is to invite some program heads down for different programs here at the college because I hope as you were listening to, to Sam speak that you were motivated and inspired. And as he mentioned, you know, education is key. So if you're thinking, you know, hey, I, I want to do this job or that job, or maybe I'm still thinking about some ideas, um, this is a great way for you to take some notes, see what programs the college has to offer and what you might want to engage in. So first program head, Mr. Josh Gooch, if you'd come on down. We're going to give each program head about one, two minutes to speak, just an overview of their program.
Hey y'all. As mentioned, my name is Josh Gooch, Program Head, Advertising and Graphic Design. And in regards to entrepreneurship, uh, the world of graphic design is certainly full of them. Uh, from small agencies, which again are, are usually comprised of just a handful of people, all the way up to the independent designer who simply just wants to work freelance. Uh, there's always uh, been that sort of drive within the graphic design area for uh, little, little tiny voices to come up and help build large brands for uh, for really any sort of business uh, that's out there. In terms of our program, uh, we try and just simply develop well-rounded designers who can really shape the voice and help the communication voice for any any business, any individual, and as pretty much everybody's well aware, uh, today's world requires brands and from, from uh, independent people all the way up to, again, corporations, uh, the voice that that particular business takes is as important uh, as really any other component uh, that they have because it's all about communication and that's really kind of what we're trying to do as far as uh, shaping our students to help build those voices. So, Thank thanks. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome job. Awesome job. And Mr. Adam Carricker, come on down. Come on down. Yeah. Uh oh. Have a following, Adam. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm Adam Carricker, program head for simulation and game development. I've only got two minutes, so I'm going to talk a little bit quickly about all the things that our students do as far as it relates to entrepreneurship. Is that okay? That's perfect. All right, so basically what we do is, is our students, we teach them to make video games, which is pretty cool. But the problem with that is a company that makes a video game, something that you guys have probably played, is a company that has three to 500 people, and they're working three to five years to make a game. What's really cool about that is when it gets down to crunch time, they have to hire freelance people to help finish the game because they've been working on it for five years. They have a deadline that they have to meet. So what we teach our students to do is hopefully to get out and put their work out onto the marketplace so that when a company needs that crunch time for somebody else to come in and just help them finalize some stuff that they can reach out to our students or our students can reach out to them. And really all they're trying to do is get their foot in the door so that they can then start working on those three to 500 man teams. That's pretty much what I've got. Is that okay? That's yeah. perfect. Great opportunity in that. Fantastic job, Adam. Adam. And Mr. John Bowman? Yeah. Oh. I'm not gonna try to talk as loud as that. Is this okay? This is good? Okay, um, so I am here for university transfer, and um, Ms. Gresham is going to kill me when she finds out what I did, because I'm not entirely going to talk about that. I want to I have two minutes or something like that. So I want to encourage all of you, I know some of you guys out there, do something, do anything, right? Um, the last speech that they had just a second ago, if you try, you're going to accomplish more than if you just sit at home. So. Um, that's what I wanted to share as part of this and as part of university transfer. A long time ago, I thought, I have no idea what I wanted to do. So I started working in business. I worked in business for 10 years. I did bookkeeping. And I really thought that that was great. I thought that that was fantastic. And then one day I kind of woke up and I thought, no, this is not what I want to do at all. So I started going back to college. Um, I went to community college. I attended community college uh, for two years. I went to Rowan Cabarrus. I took all my classes there. And then I went to the university and kept going through the university. And now I'm back here. So that happened because I decided I was going to do something like what Sam Massa just told you guys a couple minutes ago. I thought I have to try something new. So I went to community college and I earned my associates in arts degree. Now here's the tiny part that Ms. Gresham's gonna say, yes, that's what I wanted you to do. An associates in art degree is not just an art thing. It means that you have a generalized knowledge so that when you go to university, you can take the classes that you want to take. When I went to university, I thought I was gonna major in philosophy, it didn't work out, but I went to university and I majored in English. And so I got to take just my English classes. I didn't have to take anything else. I didn't have to take math. I didn't have to take sciences. I didn't have to do any of that stuff. I could take just what I wanted to take. So that's the Associates in Arts program. I did that. I really enjoyed it. Um, and because I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just went back to college. Um, I took classes in, of all things, public speaking. I think that worked out. Hi, right? <laughs> so here I am, right? Um, so I, I took that. I realized I wanted to be a teacher. And again, that's why I'm here. 
okay? So do something, do anything. Even if you've been watching this program and you've thought the entire time, well, that's nice, and, but that's not really for me. I never would have thought of that. Do anything, do something. Wake up every single day, go to school, go to college, um, earn your degree, move forward. Because when you finally figure out what you wanna do, you'll be so many steps ahead of the people that just thought, I'm gonna stay home and play the video games instead of making the video games. Okay, um, so the other last thing, so she doesn't kill me when I go back, uh, and associates and arts, we have that too. If you are one of the people whose brain thinks along the lines of science and math, that's what we have. So you take your basic science and math classes here, and then you go to university and you finish up. Okay, so did I do okay? Awesome. Yes. Okay, yes. great, okay, thanks. Thank you. That was perfect. Miss Elena Finney. My name is Elena Finney and I'm the agribusiness technology professor here at Stanley Community College. Um, if you did not know, Stanley County Ag is booming. Um, we are in the top half of everything production wise. Um, we are shipping out all kinds of meat, all kinds of animals, all kinds of vegetables right here in Stanley County. Um, and so Stanley County saw the need that we need people to work on the farms um, and be entrepreneurs and get their hands dirty um, and also work in all areas so they kind of have started and kind of we're looking for somebody to spearhead the program and lead it and so that's what I'm here because um, I love anything about ag if you bring it up I will talk your ears off and I'm totally sorry but that's my passion um, and people need to realize that the food that you go in the grocery store where it comes from um, and how it gets there and so with your agribusiness degree you're not tied to go work on a farm so get that visual out of your head okay that's one option one road you can go down but there's about 75,000 other roads that we can take you down if you want to drive around in a fancy truck and sell things guess what you can do it with an agribusiness degree if you want to sit in some lab and work with genetics you can do that with an agribusiness degree so we have a lot of different options um, so don't just get stuck on the farm um, and so hopefully by next year when you drive up the hill you'll see a greenhouse to your left um, and that will be a classroom for the kids in the agribusiness program our goal is to grow plants vegetables sell them out um, and have a quick access to mom's mother's day present or grandma's mother's day present right here on the college, so come check us out. One of our representatives from early childhood, please. Thank you ladies for being here. Hello, I'm Christy Honeycutt from um, the Early Childhood Department here at Stanley Community College, and I'm surprised I can actually see over the podium. Um, so <laughs> I was a little concerned about that when I came down here. Um, in our program um, with Early Childhood, I want to start out by saying that we are more than child care, but um, as far as entrepreneurship, I was going down the road of child care. But um, in Stanley County, there are 38 small businesses, and they employ between one and 20 or plus people. And those uh, small businesses account for about 300 plus jobs in Stanley County, and that business is licensed and regulated childcare. And that plays two roles in our economy. One is they, they are an employer, they provide jobs. And the other is they provide a safe and regulated environment for young children to be while their parents work. So those are the two roles. And in Stanley County, they care for about 1,400 children every single day and those are ages birth to five, and then over 300 before and after school age children. Nearly all child care operators in Stanley County are women, and nearly all of them receive their degree from us here at Stanley Community College. We offer um, the Associate in Applied Science in Early Childhood, and our degree offers courses in things like child guidance, language and literacy development, health, safety, and nutrition, curriculum development, observation and assessment and administration because our graduates are not babysitters they are professionals they are early educators and they are entrepreneurs our degree does transfer to several universities where students can get their bachelor's their master's and their doctorate and we have numerous students who follow that pipeline all the way through students right now that are at several universities getting their bachelor's and master's degrees we even enjoy hiring our students once they get that master's degree, we have several of our former students working for us now as adjunct instructors and full-time instructors. 
And you can start here at Stanley Community College if you're interested in a very rewarding career in working with children and you want to be an entrepreneur in the field. And we'd be happy to talk with you at any time and answer your questions. Thank you so much. Um, David Smith, cosmetology. Is he still in here? Yeah. I saw David a minute ago. We might have to round up David. Katrina, do we have an ETA or an eye in the sky on David? <laughs> While we're looking for David, do we have any? We do. We do. If someone would be willing to speak on behalf of David. Come on down, Kimberly. Come on down. Woo! Um, in David's defense, I did get a text from him a while ago, and he's over putting time in for the conference that we all went to this past weekend. Uh, David is the program head for the cosmetology department here at Stanley Community. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. And if you've been at Stanley County at all, you know that for the very first time this past year, we moved into our brand new facility um, up on the uh, top of the hill where the very last building on the right it has been years and years and years coming in that um, building we have our cosmetology program which takes approximately 15 to 18 months to complete but we also have the manicuring nail technician um, we also have the teacher training program I currently am teaching the manicuring students um, I have a teaching assistant that is getting her instructor's license, teach cosmetology in the afternoons. Um, we have students that are working on getting their cosmetology instructor's license along with their cosmetology license. So there are all different kinds of possibilities within the field. Um, if you should decide to get a cosmetology license, what a lot of people don't realize is you get three licenses in one. In the state of North Carolina, you can either be a licensed nail technician, a licensed esthetician who does skin care, or a licensed cosmetologist, which if you get that license, you are also a licensed manicurist technician and a licensed esthetician. So you can work in any of those fields. Um, I tell people this business has been very, very good to me. I started out when I graduated. This is my 30 year anniversary. Um, yeah, 30 years in the business. Um, for the first six months, worked with, a, with someone in another salon, happened to live in a small town just outside of the Outer Banks, realized that there was not another hairdresser in town under 40 years of age, saw a market, went after it, thought not going to go get the businesses there, I'm going to bring back these high school and college age kids that are driving to Greenville to get their hair done. Started a business, owned my own business for 13 years. When I was married to a highway patrolman, moved here, and someone kept saying, you know, what are you going to do when my son started school? And I kept thinking, I kind of want to be in school, same schedule he's on. Someone said, you ought to consider teaching. So went back, got my instructor's license, ended up teaching here, uh, have been the program head for cosmetology, have taught cosmetology, have taught the high school students, which we now have on our campus too. We have what's called a CCP where the high school students can come. Um, and now teaching the manicuring student as well as developing continuing education for um, the small business center and teaching classes as a licensee in the state, you have to take so much continuing education every year. And I also teach those classes for the Small Business Center. So that's just what I've done. You know, Julie, little the expert. Pardon me? You're the balayage expert. I am the balayage expert. I teach the balayage <laughs> classes. <laughs> balayage is the French word to sweep, by the way. Yes, we, we do love it. It's not painful. <laughs> so if any of y'all are considering that, I mean, you can own your own business. You can uh, have a brick and mortar you know, store. You can um, rent a booth from someone else and be your own boss. You can go to work for someone. I always say I think that owning my own business made me a better employee you know, here at the college. So I've been an employer and an employee. So um, as you said, get outside your box, 
don't just think we're just hairdressers. We have to take continuing education. We have to get degrees. We have to get licenses just like doctors and lawyers do. And I got a lot of pride in this business and we'll shout it to the rooftops any day. So that's our program. Wonderful, wonderful. Did I miss any program heads in the room? No. Of course, we have many more programs here at the college, but these were the individuals that could be with us today. Um, if you're interested in any of these programs, please see them afterwards, or if there are other programs that you have interest in, let us know, and we'll coordinate a conversation with you and the appropriate program head. But I would like to invite to the front our panelists for um, our business owners panel. So a lot of these individuals are local. We're going to engage Sam once again. Now, Sam, you have every right to say pass if some of these questions are an overlap from the presentation, but um, these individuals, I can't wait to introduce them to you. We do have a wireless for your use. Okay. All right. I don't know if I can come that far with this one, but you have that one. He told me how to use it. Perfect. Phil, it's all you. If I touch it, it's going to break. So as they're getting the microphone ready, I'm just going to briefly say again, this is our business owners panel. So please, you have a note card um, in your packet. If you didn't already fill it up with a presentation that Sam had or Mike presented with your notes, jot down some questions that you might have. We're going to go through a few just from here and prompted and go down the line, answer these questions. But at the end, we are going to open it up to the floor for you to ask questions of our panel as well. OK, so we'll just start here on the end. If you'll take just a minute to tell us your name name, what your business is, and then we'll go into the questions. All right. Hi, my name is Cyanna Clark. Um, I am local here in Albemarle. Um, I've lived here, I don't know, since 2001 when I moved from Germany. Um, so it was a culture shock when I moved here. But I um, work for It Works Global. Um, if you have Facebook, you've probably seen posts about It Works, right? Anybody? Yes, okay. Um, so it is an actual, uh, it's a health and wellness company. It is a multi-level marketing company. Um, so I do not own the company itself, but I own my own business in the company. Um, and it's just, it's, it's been an amazing thing in my life. But um, so yeah, that's really all of it is, some health products. <laughs> that's perfect. Hi, I'm Phil Balkum. Um, I have a run Parlay Design Company, um, so it's a graphic design business, and um, we, we end up kind of specializing in logos. Um, and then I also am currently launching um, a shirt shop online, uh, making custom apparel called PirantPrintShop.com. And um, so it's, it's uh, live, but not necessarily launched. So. Um, those are, those are two um, small businesses. So I'm also um, a staff full-time here at the college. Um, so happy to be part of this team um, and then get to work with um, uh, the business program as well, uh, helping teach one of the intro classes there. Um, you might even be one of my students. I'm not sure. But if you are, you did a great job. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Hallie Sykes, and I'm a physical therapist. I've been a PT for 13 years, but I'm a new business owner. I just started this summer. Uh, I moved back to North Carolina after about 10 years away, uh, traveling, working in a lot of different settings, a lot of different states. Um, moved back for family reasons and said, hey, I don't really want to work for anybody else anymore and started a business. It's therapy for living. It's downtown. Um, the emphasis is on more holistic look at physical therapy of looking at the whole body, not just you're here for shoulder pain. Let's give you some exercises. Uh, also, women's health, uh, pelvic floor rehab, and a number of other specialties, as well as just um, it's a cash-based business, so I can do wellness visits. People can just come in whenever they want to, as opposed to you have to have a doctor's prescription. So it's a little out of the box, but fun. Anyway. I thought I was here for a cooking class, but <laughs> I guess I'll talk a little bit about business. You know, the one thing I didn't say earlier, I was at a presentation last week, and there was a guy that was talking about marketing approaches to business. And so the question is, what's your business? What product do you provide? And or what product or service do you provide? And so last week, this guy was telling me, you know, imagine you're at a trade show and you got two drill bit companies side by side. One company's got the whole booth set up, and they're selling drill bits. And it's sharp, and it's strong, and there's all the things that are so great about the drill bit. And the other company across the aisle is selling holes. 
holes in things. So they're selling the ability to put a hole in a piece of whatever the material is. So you think about it, like what service do you provide in business? We provide the ability for firefighters to do their job safely at night. We happen to do it using a light fixture, but when someone asks us what we do, I don't sell drill bits, I sell holes. I mean, I sell the ability to work after dark. So what service we provide or product we provide, the products are light, but the ability to work is what we're selling. That's awesome, thank you, Sam. Okay, we'll start back from the top. I see it, okay, so my, my next question for you is what caused you to start your own business? Um, well, about two years ago, um, I decided to start my business with It Works. I am a stay-at-home mom. I homeschool my son, who's recording all this. Um, so I was, able, I was staying home. Um, my husband works, and he's always gone um, crazy hours. He works in the asphalt business, um, so there's no set schedule. Um, I was not able to work a real job with you know the nine to fives um, with a lot of health issues that I've had so when I found this company I started using it I was on probably 20 something medicines from different doctors and I was tired of all the medicines so I wanted a more holistic approach and that's when I found it works because they're all natural um, pr uh, products that could help me and you know one little supplement can help so many things so I started taking these supplements and I was getting healthier and I, my um, health conditions were getting better. And that's when I was like, well, you know what, instead of just using and being a product of these products, I could also help other people and make money in the process to help um, our financial situations at home and help my husband bring in money and still be able to stay at home and homeschool my son. So that's when I really looked into it and um, that's when I decided to start my business. So. Uh, let's see. So I decided to start my own because um, it's just something that I enjoyed doing. It's graphic design. Um, <clears throat> I had been doing it for quite a long time, actually, uh, off and on, um, but it was just on the side. So uh, I would do a small project, not necessarily ever even charge for it, just kind of a, a service that I could provide to help out. And so I thought, well, let's put, you know, let's put some wheels to it and make this thing official um, because uh, it's not that hard to do and to start a business. Um, I was, uh, it probably took me a lot longer because I was kind of intimidated about the process because it, it feels like an overwhelming prospect to, uh, to make an official business. And then when I uh, people like Alicia helped me determine that that wasn't actually the case. Um, it was a lot easier to get started than I thought. I thought, well, let's go do this. It's something that I enjoy. I also um, had a desire to um, start something that could give, could um, could be another source of uh, revenue down the road, something that I could grow at my own pace and uh, help support my family. And um, and then so branching out into a, another business and um, starting a, a shirt shop was just because I, I like I really like to wear t-shirts um, so uh, I, you know there's there's nothing better than the perfect t-shirt everybody's got their favorite t-shirt right and um, so I inadvertently ended up with like eight cat shirts like it's uh, it's not really worth me telling the story now but so I just wore all these t-shirts all the time and started to just end up with this arsenal of really cool shirts I thought man I want to go make my own and what if I could sell them to people and just see people walking around with my own cat shirts and you know I don't just sell cat shirts but um, so it just kind of came out of a passion for something that I enjoy doing you know Sam said a couple times up here just find something that you like and go after it and so that's um, that's why I started my own business um, I didn't exactly expect to start my own business this past year. I was sort of, I was working full time in Maine and starting to see some patients on the side, um, sort of part time and enjoying that. And then, like I said, family event happened. My stepfather passed away, so I moved home. And there wasn't anywhere that I really wanted to work here. And I have learned a lot that's sort of outside of the box. and. I don't know, it all kind of came together. I found a building, I found a space, I started a business, here I am. Um, but I'd say another part of it too was frustration with how healthcare is making you work within the insurance system as opposed to what the patient needs and wanting to branch outside of that. So it all kind of came together at one time and here I am, so. 
So why did I start my business? I think, well, I didn't want to flip burgers at Burger King, and that's a fine job. It pays better in some states than others, but it's an interesting job. But I thought that maybe there would be something cooler to do than just walk a standard path. I definitely didn't like school, and I thought fire trucks were cool. I liked the air horn. I mean, you kind of marry all your passions together. And I mean, if I could make a business selling shoestrings, and I was into shoestrings, then by golly, that's what I'd be doing. I just don't like shoestrings. I don't like flipping burgers. I thought fire trucks were cool. And of course, you heard the story before, and now here we are. Thank you, Sam. All right. So, um, what has been the most challenging situation you have faced in owning a business? If you could narrow it down to one or two. Ish. Yeah, that's a loaded question. Um, I think getting in your own way is your biggest challenge. Um, there's going to be outside factors that are thrown at you all the time. And you have, um, as was mentioned earlier, the choice to let those either move you forward or hold you back. It's so easy, and I've had so many on my team that they get rejected a couple times, and they're like, oh, this isn't for me. I'm not going to do it anymore, and they quit. Um, and then I've had others, um, including myself, that you get that rejection, and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to cry. I'm going to you know, fix a glass of wine, and then I'm going to get back to it. Um, so you can either let it hold you back or you can you know, let it move you forward. But you are, to me anyways, I think I am my biggest challenge because I can either stop myself or I can let myself go. So out of everything that can be thrown at you, I think you know, your mindset and what you do and what, you, what choices you make are gonna be your biggest challenge. Uh, trying to figure out how to get the cheese, right? So um, uh, I think time has been just an issue of, um, I'm, I'm, I do have a full-time job, I got two small kids, I'm volunteering and some other things outside of this, but I know I wanted to go and to do this. So figuring out how to work that in and to give it enough to make it viable um, has definitely been an option. And then um, I guess trying to convince the uh, consumer that, that they need your product and um, that, it, that it's something that can change, um, change the game for them, even though they may not necessarily be able to see that and comprehend that, um, showing them why you are good for another business or good for a consumer. Um, which, you know, a lot of that's just kind of marketing and, and putting in the time to communicate that and figuring out how best to communicate that. So. Um, I'd say the most challenging thing has actually been trying to fill out my Medicare paperwork, but that doesn't really <laughs> pertain to this setting. Uh, but other than that, I would actually agree with Sianna. Sianna. Um, probably my own obstacles and part of its marketing of I'm not someone who talks up my own skills and that's never been how I am. Um, I'm always been a team player of you know everybody in the office is going to be good and you'll get great service and whatever. Only you know now it's me and I'm the only one in the office and I want to tell people why they should come to see me and not somebody else and I'm having to learn to do that but still not feel like I'm a jerk because I don't like that person. So I guess marketing is a challenge and overcoming my own personality quirks with it, but. So challenge wise, you know, I think it was interesting in my business career, I'm still sort of early in it, but there's different things I've done. You know, in school, I had a very hard time taking a test and I had a very hard time reading. And when I broke into the business world, like my computer, his name is Alex, he's sitting on the floor and Alex talks to me. So when I, when I get an email, I get 200 emails a day. And sometimes they're long, sometimes they're really rambly and sometimes they're not worth reading. But in order to filter them out quick, I mean, if it's something like that last paragraph on the screen, I've read it a thousand times, an email's new every time. So getting from school to the business world and being able to self-advocate for I mean, like taking a Scantron test, some of y'all might take great Scantrons, some of y'all might not take great Scantrons. I sat through a thousand hours of hazardous material technical specialist training, and then at the end of it, I had to take a Scantron. And so if I would have just gone up and, and scribbled the bubbles in, I would have failed the test, but I sat through the class, and then I made the request for an accommodation, and it's hard sometimes to say, hey, I'm not real great at this, but I know the material, can you give me an accommodation? And the school system, you know, and it transfers to the business world. It could be school, it could be business. But it's so important that you, if you need a hand in something, especially if you're competent in it, to not get hung up on 
something silly like where you put the bubble on the test. I mean, I would never have been employed in the emergency services industry if I just took the test or just read the book online. I mean, the, the EMT book, I told you I didn't do it very well on the online class because you had to read everything. So I ended up getting a hold of Jones and Barlett Learning and getting the audio version. And there's words like fig momentometer. I couldn't tell you how to spell it or how many letters are in it. But when you hear it, I remember it and understand it's a blood pressure cuff. And you would just skip that stuff if you don't self-advocate and say, hey, I need the book on PDF so Alex can read it, or I need the, the audio copy. So I think from that you know, aspect, dealing with a learning disability that's not really a disability, it just makes it sometimes a pain because you got to ask the question. Not being afraid to ask the question has been challenging for me. But then aside from the personal challenge, business-wise, it's been very difficult to get young employees that are in my age group motivated to show up on time or to do the job correctly or to finish the job. I mean, if I pay a guy $10 an hour, or I pay him $15 an hour in Seattle, because that's the minimum wage out there, to put a light in a box. We had a guy the other day on a fire truck line. Sorry, I'm taking too much time. But on the fire truck lines, when you build a fire truck, it's a million dollar fire truck. And if there's 300 fire trucks on the line, the manufacturer has to pay the interest on those trucks as they come down the line, because they can afford to hold $300 million of inventory on the line. So you order a light, say a light for the front of the cab, and it's supposed to be black, and we don't have it in stock. The correct way to deal with that problem is to call the customer and tell them we don't have it in stock. But sometimes I get guys that, well, that's gonna be a pain, I gotta make two phone calls. They'll just put the light in the box and then ship the thing. Well, now we hit a light on a, on a fire truck line, they're paying interest on trucks. Every day costs them $25,000 when they're delayed. So it's $10,000 an hour is what we get stuck paying because my guy, messed up putting a light. That's a penalty and that's a line delay charge. Because he puts the wrong color light in a box because he's too lazy to pick up the phone and call me so I can call the customer and schedule the line delay. I mean, it's silly things like having an employee workforce, I mean, we train them on this. We take them to the factory, we go through it. But sometimes it's like, oh yeah, but it was 4.45 and if I just throw it in the box, we ship it out the door. So it's unfortunate because you find things where even in an entry level position, we want our entry level people to work up to being the executives in the business. But when it's as simple as putting the right light in the box, having enough pride in your job to do that correctly on time, if I had to pay the guy $200 an hour to do the job correctly, I would do it. It's just, I can't get the guy to do it. So I gotta get him to show up on time and to put the, light, the right light in the box. And what, we, what business owners end up doing is we end up automating. So we've got these new systems that now you have to scan the light, scan the box, scan the purchase order. And if they don't do it enough times, then I get a notice and their temp agency comes in and puts someone else in, in the spot. So I think that, you know, challenge wise, employee workforce is difficult. And sometimes to start in business, it helps to be an employee in a business. But even if you're just working somewhere, I mean, put the right light in the box, you'll shine. The business owner will be stoked and maybe they'll fund your next business operation because you were that star employee that saved them $10,000 an hour in line delays. That's awesome. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My next question, did someone inspire you to start a business or mentor you through the process? Um, as far as inspiring me originally to start my business, um, that was just, I saw the opportunity, so I took it. Um, but now my inspiration is um, my husband and my son. Um, I have the potential in this business to retire my husband before he turns 40. Um, and I still have a couple years for that. He's only 33. But um, that gives me some time to work. Um, but I want to be able to retire him and for us to be a full-time family. Um, keeping Memphis home every day is my inspiration because I don't want him to see me fail. I don't want him to grow up and think, well, you know, I can just quit if I want to. Um, I, so he's my inspiration to keep pushing and to keep going. Um, and what I love about this company is because it is such a global market and there are so many distributors worldwide um, that we're all one team and one mission. So I can go to anybody in this company and find a mentor. And I have found them even direct, not directly on my team. Um, I just, you know, there, there's so many, and I try to do the same for my team members too, um, just to mentor it as much as I can. But every day you learn something new, so um, I take every day as a learning um, opportunity, and so I always keep going forward. Sam Massa. <laughs> right? Yeah. There you go. Um, well, I, I think maybe design inspired me, inspired me to, to get into design. I mean, that's not a person 
Um, but I would just see, uh, I would see design everywhere. I mean, it's on your, it's on your shirts, it's, uh, it's on your TV, um, it's on the front of your textbook. I mean, so you, you see design everywhere, and I think I would see good design, and I would appreciate it, and I would want to figure out how somebody made that, um, and, and go YouTube the process, um, or I don't know how you did that, so let's go Google it. And I would see bad design, and it kind of bummed me out, and I'll think, ah, you know, how could I have made that better? Um, and then all that just kind of came to, um, you can't actually affect that if you're not in that, in that game and in that environment. So um, why not uh, go ahead and get in there and see if you can have um, affect change um, in, in that kind of environment. So um, be someone that can help someone get good design when you, if, you, if you see them kind of um, <clears throat> settling for something poor but paying out the roof for it. Um, my heart's just been to, to put good design out there and affect my community um, and make it a better place through something like design because that's what I can offer. So I think just seeing it and then investigating it and then trying to impact it um, was in my inspiration there. Um, well, it's not quite design, but I would say like taking care of my patients has always been my biggest inspiration. Uh, I've never, when I was in school, I wouldn't say, oh, I have a passion to work with pediatrics or I have a passion to do this. It's more the patient in front of me that wants me to make me want to be the best PT that I can to get whatever they need out of the service. Um, so wanting to be the best physical therapist for my patients was probably my biggest inspiration. Um, truthfully, I used to have like, actually, I remember a very vivid, literal nightmare about owning my own business. Um, it was about five years ago, but apparently things have evolved since then. Um, and I don't have any nightmares about it now, it's good. But uh, as far as mentoring through, like Alicia, the Small Business Center has been so helpful. Um, I've learned a lot. I know the PT side of things, the business side is coming. Um, but it's not as scary as I thought it would be other than the Medicare paperwork, so there we go. <laughs> so starting my business, my parents were fairly inspirational. My dad worked in high tech and my mom, she was a, well she was a mom when I was a kid and now she's I call her a feelings repair specialist. She does like, like clinical social work, I guess is the word. I don't know what she does. But anyway, she helps people feel better when they have a bad day. So anyway, they were a good inspiration, you know, when I was young. And then of course, Donnie, who I mentioned in the presentation, he was a really inspirational character that taught me a lot about the fire industry and a lot about life in general. And then now, you know, my wife, she works in the business and she's a rock star. She's a lot harder worker than I am. I think I, I like to do the work smarter, not harder. That girl, she will just like, you hook a sled to her and she'll run all the way to the moon. So she's a real hard worker. And I think she's inspirational because I couldn't work that hard. I would, I would run out of gas and she just keeps on going, so. Thank you. Just a couple more questions from the panel. So again, please be thinking about questions that you have for them. But the next question that I have is, uh, what is your most rewarding part of owning a business? Um. For me, it's the freedom to be able to spend time with my son. I haven't missed any moments. Um, now, yes, I was a stay-at-home mom already, um, so I still didn't miss moments, but now I am able to help, um, you know, bring in money. I, we can afford to do the extra now. Um, so family vacations, I don't think we took one until he was, I don't know, probably six, because we couldn't afford it, you know, that one income. Um, so now we have the freedom to do the extra, and it's not going to worry us. I can tell my husband, hey, look, I want to go to the beach this weekend. You need to take three days off of work. And he's not going to be like, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen because we have to pay the power bill. Um, it's covered. I mean, we have it now. So for me, the most rewarding thing is the freedom, and I don't have to you know, spare, anything like that? Uh, I think just seeing something that you made get put to use, and whether it's, you know, you walk by somebody that's got a design that you made on a t-shirt, it's just, it's really cool. Uh, or, or, or coming across their social media and just seeing, seeing the impact that you had. And um, it's also really rewarding when a client, um, I can get a client to talk like a pirate because somehow, both my businesses ended up being pirate themed and so if i get an email that starts with like ahoy or something like it feels like a win already so it's rewarding um well most rewarding part for me is happy patients who you know have been having pain for years and now don't and that's i get really like ridiculously excited um but the other part of that is really the freedom of it uh 
after 13 years of working in hospitals primarily or other people's businesses where somebody else sets my schedule, like I love to be able to say, you know what, I need to be here and visit this person that day so I can't see you then but I can see you after work hours because that works for me and it's more convenient for you and I'm not stuck in the basement. PT departments are usually in a basement, just for the record, um, or an ancillary building, especially up north if you have to walk out to the hospital in the snow. But anyway, um, now I'm right downtown. I can walk out to lunch. I can do whatever, for, you know, just the freedom of it is really nice, so. I got something to show you guys. I actually forgot it before. It helps answer this question. Hold on. I'm glad this mic can run with me. <laughs> All right, I got these papers someone made for me one time. All right, so for me, the most rewarding part of my, what is it, part of owning a business is the flexibility to do other stuff. So I don't really have much time. I'm on the road like 170 days a year, or something crazy like that. But I enjoyed learning the emergency services industry was really cool because you can affect change on a fire truck if it's, or an ambulance. I really like the ambulance side. I hate washing fire hose and I like helping people. Buildings are insured and people are insured, but they still die. If a building burns down, you build a new one. So the, the most you know, important thing in my life, I think, is doing things through business as just a vehicle to allow me to do stuff I like, whether it's water skiing or something else. But what I think is really neat is, so these certificates, I'm gonna set this mic down. These are cardiac arrests that I got to work on the ambulance. And so they, 911, hey, my husband's laying on the floor, he's turned blue like a Smurf, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to do CPR, send someone help. So working in the emergency services industry for a couple of years, those are cardiac arrests that we got, what's called ROSC, Return of Spontaneous Circulation. And for me, when those patients come back to the fire station, or one of them, the girl worked at the car dealership in town, and I just happened to be in town, heard it over the radio, and stopped in and worked the, worked the code for, I mean, you work 20 minutes in the field, you're breathing for someone, you're beating on their heart, you're starting intravenous medication, whatever you're working on, you run the monitor. So there's so many things that happen in that world. That has nothing to do with business, but if I just worked at the Waffle House, then I couldn't afford the time to go ride out in the ambulance and do that work. And it doesn't pay well. I mean, that industry pays $10 an hour for a guy that takes two years to go through medic school. But the reward is when someone comes back and shakes your hand and says, thank you, the business allowed me to work in that industry. And that industry really is impactful because there's people, I mean, like Donnie's wife, we got spontaneous circulation in the field on Donnie. That's the best you can do in the field. I mean, we, he didn't survive, but his wife can come back and say, thank you. And it means a lot to me to be able to help people because you can't replace a person. I mean, someone dies, they're gone. So I think that's, for me, the, the ability to do that. Thank you, Sam. And I have one final question. Um, and that is, if you had a word of advice to give to someone who wants to start their own business, what would it be? Huh. So I would say don't be scared to try anything and everything. Um, fear goes away. Um, so definitely do that and you know and set a goal don't set outrageous goals that you know you can't reach um my goal like you know for example is to retire my husband but i know i'm not going to do that tomorrow so i have that goal i wanted to have him retired by 40 so it's broken down in two years and it's broken down into months and every day i you know i sit down I'm like what is my goal today that i'm going to work on to reach that goal um, so break your goals down into smaller steps so that you can reach it and you're not going to get frustrated because, you know, it's been three days and I haven't retired him yet. You know, whatever it is, like break it down into smaller steps and don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of trying new things. Just just go and do it. That's the only way it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, I'd, similarly, I'd say um, determine, um, determine what is keeping you from starting that business, um, whether it's one thing or five things. So determine what they are and then go, go get a solution to them. Don't let, don't let those things just kind of eat at you and, and stop you um, because you've got, you've got the creativity, you've got, um, you've got the, the skill set, uh, you've got the education for it. Um, if it's just a couple items that you think you can't get over, and find a solution for it because there is a solution because people start business all the time and have a lot of success. So, so I would say determine the roadblock and then find a solution. Um, don't just let it be a roadblock and stop you. Thank you. Um, I would say, first of all, sometimes things just line up and if you spend all of your time analyzing it and planning it and whatever, 
I don't know if you're ever going to get past the planning stage, but when the opportunity presents itself, I think sometimes you just have to jump and chips fall where they may and you'll make it work. Um, but I would also say, well, yeah, sort of along that long line, like, you know, I had a vision for what I want, but you just let it evolve as it happens and maybe it'll get to what it, what I wanted it to be. Maybe it's going to be something entirely different, but enjoyable, something that I love. Um, and in that line, I find like there were all these people when I was starting who were like, oh yeah, I'm going to be there. I'm going to recommend all of my friends. We're going to be there. I have not seen those people. <laughs> I've had other friends who own businesses who say the exact same thing. So don't set your heart on, well, these people are going to be the ones who build me up, but instead know that you know what you're doing and put yourself out there. And then like people I have never met before have been like my biggest supporters and have recommended like every single member of their family. Um, it's been great, but if I had come in with that, well, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so is going to support me, I think I would have been really upset, but it's just kind of evolving, and like I said, you just have to be open and just go with it. Thank you. Have you guys ever heard of the phrase, you are the company you keep? Mm -hmm. So if you hang out with people that decide it's a good idea to sit around and smoke a doobie instead of put their shoes on and go to work, well then... Maybe that's not something appropriate to say at school. Sorry if it isn't. <laughs> You're not going to go very far. If you sit around with guys that are motivated, whether they work for someone else, they work for themselves, or they sit around with business executives, or you sit around with motivated people, you know, the friendships that you have, you almost have to just if you want to make the decision personally, you're going to go do something, then think about the people that you hang out with, and you don't have to disown your friends, but if you want to be successful, associate yourself with successful people. And if you just want to sit around and do things that you can't do at school, then fine, but you're not going to go very far and you'll probably end up in the back of a truck turned blue for sticking a needle in your arm. And it's like the sorts of things that people think about. If you hang out with successful people and you don't get in the weeds with things that occur outside of school, that, whether it's drugs and alcohol or other stuff, just keep your head on straight and work hard and don't be afraid to work harder than the next guy because if you push a rock really hard no matter how hard you get a tractor they get a dump truck you tie a rope to it eventually you can push it hard enough to move it i mean people literally dig up mountains so you are the company you keep stay with people that are successful or, or learn from people that are successful and just work hard work harder than the next guy and you'll be more successful now how many of you knew that we had a small business center that can help you with that yeah ah uh, see so for you, if you need machine parts, you might could do a shared space, go in and let someone like contract with someone that already has the machinery, get some prototypes, maybe do that. Um, wanting to differentiate yourself, look at the market, you know, do we have another kit salon here? If not, might be a really good opportunity and just maybe you could partner with somebody that's already doing some kid services. Right, so then you have your target market just right there. It's like low-hanging fruit at that point. And then for you to differentiate, maybe there are a ton of nail salons in Charlotte. Maybe your location should be here, something to look at. And maybe there are a ton of nail salons in Stanley County, but is there one in Norwood or in Oakboro or something like that? But then that another great opportunity for shared space, like you mentioned. So these things, like Phil said, identify what's holding you back. And then, you know, like someone else had mentioned, don't, don't be afraid to ask for help, like Sam said, and, and come. Let us, because I'll tell you, as the director of our small business center, I'm here to sit down with you, help you, take you every step of the way. But if I don't have the answer, I'm going to find someone who does. So here at the college, and I'm not the only one with that, that mindset, we all want to help you. So you can come to us, let us know what your frustrations are, anything that's holding you back, and we truly are here to help you. We, we have gratification. What inspires us is your success. So any more questions before we transition I, to the uh, product demo? Yeah, please. Yeah, so just I want to really praise the Small Business Center. They've, they've helped me a ton, uh, helped me get started with, with both businesses now. Um, and I mean, I'm going to a seminar tomorrow um, from a copyright lawyer out of Charlotte that's coming in. So they're hosting this thing, and it's a, that's something I, I legitimately need to know. It's questions that I have, and my small business center in town is offering that. So don't underestimate them as a resource and as a place to launch because they, they've got a lot of wisdom and will help you, you know, find, find the answers that you need to get started. I mean, that's, that's why I got started because I went to a small business center and said, hey, I got this crazy idea, you know, what do I do? And um, they gave me a list of things to do, so. And it's um, great. 
Like, and it's free, yeah. It is free. It yeah, is free. I mean, I just give them high fives. That's how I pay them. So, I That's mean, right. it, it's, I it's such a good resource. So, you know, if you don't know how to get started, just go there and say that. So. Thank you so much. Yes, Hallie, please. Um, the other thing I would say, I mean, y'all are in school. Yes, if you can pull a Sam and just jump out and start a business, rock on. That's awesome. Um, I had a 13-year career before I got here. And I will say the one thing I recommend, like if you want to start a nail salon, work at the best nail salon you can work at. I picked hard jobs. I went places that were challenging. There's a lot of places in the PT world. You can just basically fill out the paperwork and go home and collect a paycheck. That's not who I want to be, and that's not how I got here. I picked the jobs that I learned something from. I mean, I put in an application to cover for a clinic in Manhattan. I said, there's no way on earth I'm qualified for this. But I ended up working in Manhattan with the guy who teaches the classes that I was taking for four months and learned so much. He had a cash-based business. And then I learned from that of, OK, well, this is what I like. This is what I want to become. Um, and this is how I want to do it. So don't take the easy road. Pick the jobs that are going to challenge you or the jobs that you're going to learn something from. And that's going to help you figure out how you want to do it. So, Thank you so much. Any more closing comments from our panel? Please, if you have anything. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Well, guys, I hope that if you didn't feel comfortable asking questions in a group setting that you'll do some one-on-one. -on -one. We are going to transition to parking lot E very shortly and see Sam's cars, or trucks, not cars. They're really awesome trucks that anyone would want to. Um, yes, sir. I'll take it. Okay. Um, but yes, I, I was fascinated when I saw them and I was in awe and I can't wait to go see them again. So just some special thanks very quickly because I want you to have plenty of time to see Sam's trucks. I want to thank Mark Sample for setup today. Also Andre Burroughs and Garrett for audio visuals. Thank you. Katrina Sams for doing registration. Shana Poole for setup yesterday. Thank you. And thank you Merlin um, being over our department and supporting us in this initiative. So again, want to direct you to parking lot E. You do not want to miss Sam's trucks. Very easy to find. If you're having trouble, you can follow me over there. I'm going to be like a little kid running to go see the demo. Okay. So thank you so much for coming.